shopkeepers and school teachers and people that just wanted to live an ordinary life free from dictatorship, uh, and they were fighting, and that if the United States did not help them, what would happen is a bunch of uh, radical al-Qaeda types would. And, of course, that's exactly what's happened. Uh, now we have what's becoming almost a full-scale war in the Middle East. You've got a Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and interestingly Israel on the side of the rebels against Hezbollah, Assad, Russia, and Iran on the side of the government. 70,000, at least 70,000 Syrians are dead. Now they say up to 100,000. Uh, the regime regularly kills men, women, and children. There's 4.5 million Syrian people who are out of their homes. Uh, 1 million are out of Syria. Basically, all the good, normal people are leaving the country, and now it's becoming a battle between Al Qaeda and uh, and and the government, uh, which none of neither side I like very much. Uh, so to me, that's all hindsight that we should have helped them when we had the chance. Last last point before I get you too involved is the Obama administration said there are going to be red lines, red lines if. Assad, the dictator of Syria, starts to use chemical weapons against his own people. That would be a game changer, said the president. Uh, now, Britain and France and Israel have all put forward evidence of uh, chemical weapons, and Obama may do something. He's still studying the issue, but it seems to me that his red line and his game changing, if, if that doesn't hold true, uh, we're going to have a lot of people not believing the president on anything. So, who wants to go first? Oh, let me jump in. All right, go ahead. Okay, because there's such a big context that has to be realized in this. If you look at the Iraq war, as for instance, um, of our involvement, the Iraq situation is we were the suppliers of Iraq's, um, you know, weapons for years, for decades. And um, then, well, you know, when we finally went into the war, it was because, you know, Hussein had been acting supposedly on himself, etc. And uh, it wasn't such an international problem at that time. Um, and the same was true in Afghanistan. The Russian settlement of course, was withdrawn years ago. We had withdrawn years ago before that. The Taliban was the enemy, et cetera. I mentioned al-Qaeda, al of course, as well. This situation is so totally different, it requires a great deal of caution, and I admire President Obama for doing that. The primary problem is, or one of the primary problems, there are so many. A, is it's so interlinked with the Mideast, with Hezbollah, et cetera. It also is linked with Russia. Russia is the one who has been, since ever since Israel bombed the uh, supposed uh, nuclear power plant in Syria that may or may not have been a pharmacy or whatever the heck it was, Russia has been the primary supplier of weapons in Syria. Actually, and, uh, just to correct you, Terry, Russia has been supplying Syria for about 50 years. So uh, yeah, well, I, know I, 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 don't, I don't want to suggest that it happened just because Israel took out a nuclear plant. I mean, no, this has been no, happening and, and, for, for many decades, just, just right, to correct you there. escalated to air defense. Um, from that point on. And Russia, in a sense, is the enemy here. I mean, it really honestly is. And that's where we've got to apply all the pressure we possibly can, which is very risky because Russia has so much oil and gas, which supplies Europe. This whole thing is so frigging complex that it is a very dangerous situation. And I don't know of a good solution except the international community, except the United Nations, and except stopping Russia. How do we stop Russia? The problem is not Syria. The problem is Russia. Well, I have some. I have some responses, but let me get Garland in here. Go ahead, Garland. Yeah, I, I would also say this. Here's the other issue that we've got to think about because we've been down this road before in Afghanistan. Um, one of the considerations is fighting alongside the, you know, Al Qaeda to overthrow um, the Syrian regime. Clearly, you know, Al Qaeda. Um, and 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 uh, you know, light minds uh, in in the Middle East um, welcome any kind of a power vacuum because they see that as an opportunity to to move a theocracy into place. So, I, I you know, I can I can very well understand that President Obama is extremely hesitant to take military action. You can wait and wait. You know, you can you can hesitate taking the action, but once you take it, you know, you can't pull back from that. Because you're there. So do we supply arms at, such as we did to the Mujahideen in Afghanistan and possibly um, train people who are going to come use those very arms to come back against us, who we may use them against Israel? God only knows who, you know, who they'll use them against, anybody they're unhappy with, any of the other maybe governments that they're unhappy with in the area. So do we supply people with weapons that will be, that will be turned back on us, number one? And number two, um, ultimately... I, I think the consideration is, where is this thing going, 
And I think that is the fear and hesitation that's being, that's creating the fear and hesitation in the international community. Because President Obama is not the only world leader who is holding back, who is hesitant. Well, actually, England and France are pushing us to take action. Uh, And Turkey is as well, and so is Jordan, and so is Saudi Arabia, and so is Qatar. So uh, the only people that are really opposed to us taking action are the people who are on the side of of the dictator Assad, Russia, Iran, uh, Hezbollah. But uh, certainly Turkey and Jordan, which are moderate, Muslim countries. Turkey, of course, is a democracy, and uh, Jordan is a, a relatively benign uh, monarchy. Uh, our, our countries are being destabilized by the refugees. Uh, it seems to me that all of our friends uh, want us to take action, and the only people who don't want us to take action are our enemies. You know what it might really come down to, guys, and this is really, really huge, is somehow that we as a government, which I know is extremely risky, everything in this is risky, we've got to deal with the Islamic community somehow or other. Because if there's to be a stop of this, it should be the Muslims, the Islamic community, that should stop it somehow or other. But they are so divided between Shia and Shia. I was just going to say, there's not one Muslim community. I know, I know. (laughs) That's the problem. and this is part of the huge problem. So, I mean, it's not, there's not a win-win situation in this, but somehow the Islamic community, the Muslim community, that, but that becomes a problem with the Arab community, et cetera, et cetera. But here's the thing, somehow Terry. Somehow there has to be some unity in the area to do I something. think there is largely unity. Uh, if you look at the, the Syrian people, overwhelmingly want Assad gone. If you look at uh, Arab Americans, they overwhelmingly want Assad gone. If you look at our allies, uh, whether you look at our Arab allies in Jerusalem, Jordan, uh, our Turkish allies, our Israeli allies, or our European allies, everyone, and even President Obama has said that he wants Assad gone. It seems to me, though, that President Obama has had this idea that if we did nothing, the war would suddenly simmer and go away. Uh, it seems to so. me, well, yeah. but here's my, my, my concern is that by doing nothing, we've actually made the problem worse. That had we acted a year ago, had we had a strong no-fly zone when Syrian aircraft started bombing and killing the Syrian people, uh, had, then we would have been on the right side of history for once, which would be nice to have the American people actually on the side of people fighting for democracy. Al-Qaeda was non-existent in Syria two years ago. Absolutely what do you think non-existent. What would do if we had started attacking Syria? Nothing. You really think so? Yes, they didn't do anything and, and in if, Libya. If, if it involved NATO and Russia's controlling all that well, let me, gas let me, let me give you I, oil. Let me give you what I think is a, is a very clear precedent, and that's the precedent in Kosovo. So Russia was arming Serbia. Serbia was Russia's longtime ally. ally. Ru- Serbia has been an ally of Russia since uh, before World War I. So this is a much longer-term alliance than one with Syria, and frankly one that Russia cares a lot more about because Serbia and Kosovo were a lot closer to Russia's borders than Syria. What did we do? It, the Serbia started massacring, uh, committing genocide against the, the Muslim uh, Kosovars, and we went in and Bill Clinton, I, I know th- there's no such thing as a perfect war, but uh, I would say one of the best uh, done wars there was, we did air power we lost, I believe, one US plane we freed an entire nation from genocide, that's, v- that's an independent country today, it's very peaceful and prosperous and, and is thankful to America and we didn't do it for oil, we did it to save people's lives, I think that's the precedent, and I Except really don't, the whole situation with Russia yeah. has changed. Yeah, but I don't, did not have the oil and gas reserves that it has then. Oh, that has sure. Today. Let me get to Garland, though. Go yeah, ahead, I Garland. Think, yeah, I, I don't necessarily agree with Terry. I, I kind of agree with Mark when it comes to Russia. I don't see where, because of Russia's economic interest, I don't see Russia itching to get into any kind of a military confrontation with anyone, least of all the U.S. Right now, you know, their their economy is building, and they've got a lot of money coming in in, in oil and gas, and, and um they don't want to get into a military confrontation that's going to... That's going no, to but an economic confrontation. Plus, they, they don't want the entire Arab world to be mad at them. That's the other thing. I mean, if Russia comes down with a heavy hand, they can do that in Chechnya and Dagestan. Obviously, I think it's awful what they've done there, but that's within the boundaries of Russia, and no one can really complain. If they were to take a heavy hand in supporting the dictatorship in Syria, the entire Muslim world, which is already kind of upset because of Chechnya and Dagestan, would immediately become anti-Russia. I don't think Russia cares that much. They'll arm Syria, to be sure, but right. I don't think they'll do, do anything more. I mean, But I'm not saying that they would do something militarily. They don't have to do anything What, what are you suggesting? They control the oil and the gas that's taking care of half of Europe. They're going to cut off oil and gas supplies to Europe? 
they, is that really what you're suggesting? Or, they, yeah, nah, they haven't even threatened that. Gonna, again, if they cut it off, they're actually selling that stuff to Europe. Right, it helps them. Away. Right. So if they, if they cut it off, that means they cut off money coming in to Russia, and I certainly don't think that they're going to do that. Uh, the no, thing to keep in mind here is to any of the NATO countries is, look, if you guys get involved in this and you support this, we're go- all you have to do is make the threat. The Europeans can't afford that. Well, but threat. they haven't made that threat. This has been going on for a year. The idea, at least, of taking action has been going on for a year. Well, no, uh, no, they've done it to Estonia. Well, but Estonia done, is was within the Soviet Union. I mean, I look, I was I, was right, but I, I just think Estonia is a much more important interest to, to Russia than, than Syria is. Let me make one last point, and then I'll, I'll let you both go at it. And that is the point of, frankly, President Obama's credibility. So he set this red line. It's, it's not my red line, to be fair. I, I would have acted, as you know, a year, a year and a half ago. I advocated that right here on the Rockus Caucus. But Obama set this red line. He said, if they use chemical weapons, that's our red line. That's a game changer. That would change everything that would get us involved and uh what happened obama called his bluff i mean uh, i'm excuse me Assad called obama's bluff maybe obama was bluffing in the hopes that they wouldn't use these awful things uh, frankly I, personally i don't really care whether they murder uh, tens of thousands of people conventionally or through chemical weapons i think it's awful no matter how you die but whatever obama set this red line if he does not enforce his own red line is that not a message to North Korea, to Iran, and not to mention to the Republicans that, frankly, Obama's red lines are not so red and not such a line? And the, well, the question is, there's nothing quite is, so tragic. There's nothing quite so tragic as going to war for political reasons. This is isn't political. This isn't political go, reasons. No, 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 no. no, no. Go, the politics are against me. The American people don't want us to go get involved in Syria. I recognize that. I'm no, arguing something that's impolitic. The, I agree. But the point is, the point is, like you brought in the idea of the Republicans, it'll be used. Ex- extraordinarily viciously against Obama if the things get worse. The point is, when we go into war for political reasons, which would become a political reason because the Republicans are attacking him and would attack him in the election, that's the wrong reason to go to no, war. But if we're going to solve this, if we're going to solve this, we have to get some other country. Oh, I agree Israel. it should be multilateral. I agree. Yeah, should Britain well, and France sure. be, yeah, and Italy should join with other, us. I agree with that, but they will. Other, We've got to get some other Mid-Eastern countries. Saudi Arabia and Qatar will join with us, no doubt about it. They're just looking we'll for U.S. leadership. Saudi Arabia and Qatar, they're already arming the rebels. I guarantee you they will join with us. Uh, they, absolutely. Let them take the lead. Then. Well, they can't take the lead because they don't have that much power. But let me, let me go to Garland because I want, Garland, if you'll address the red line issue. Once a president makes a, a ruling, sets a red line, even if it's one we don't agree with, doesn't he have to keep up on it or, or lose his credibility? No. Well, let me get Garland's view on that. Go ahead, Garland. Garland? I knew Garland agreed with me. No, Garland's it. running and hiding. Where are you, Garland? <laughs> he's he's deep. In, he's deep in thought, knowing that my point. I, d- I, I don't know. Maybe we <laughs> lost. We maybe we lost Garland. Did, uh, but it, it it is frightening because I mean you know what kind of a he shouldn't have made that kind of statement to begin with. I mean it's a stupid statement to make. You know, for any conflict situation to say, okay, here's my line line in the sand. You know, then of course you're forced into some kind of chaos, and everybody's going to push and play. It's a plain chicken. It's politically stupid to do that. Now that he's done well, it's, it... It's, again, I wouldn't have set that red line either, but now that he's done it, doesn't he have to stand by it? No, but he does have to have, have something happen. You're absolutely right in that regard. Something has to happen. Something has to change. You know, whether it's Turkish troops getting involved, whether it's Saudi Arabian troops getting involved, something has to happen there. We have to push for it. There's no question about that. But we can't stand up and take the lead because it's going to backfire. Well, okay. Well, and this I agree with you. And again, Garland, if you're listening, come back in and join the conversation. Otherwise, we'll get you back after the commercial break. Uh, but uh, one thing I do agree with you, Terry, is it has to be an international effort. I don't think that's hard to do. It will not, however, be United Nations effort. The, the, the Russia has a veto still in yep. the United Nations, and it ain't going to happen, and to even suggest it's going to happen is it's disingenuous. We all know Russia won't allow it to happen. But again, I use Kosovo as my example. We did that through NATO. We did that without a United Nations resolution. England and France have been chopping at the bit uh, to do something. Turkey and Jordan have been pushing us to do something, and Saudi Arabia and Qatar have been secretly funneling arms to the rebels for at least a year now. And the way I I see it is this Assad is going to leave power. I I, I predict this. I, I don't doubt it for a bit. I don't know whether it's going to happen a month from now or a year from now. But, but within five years equation. from now, he's you know, going to be left gone. Out of the equation, Iran. And what's really going to happen? Well, Iran there. is basically invading Syria right now. They've got Hezbollah in there on the ground. They've got Iranian elements on the ground doing their best to to defend Assad. 
Yeah, that's what I mean. I mean, what you're going to possibly threaten here is if, if this gets the least bit out of hand, you have a world war in the Middle East. I wouldn't call it a world war, but, world war, but it's already happening. See, here's the thing. I, I think, Terry, when you say things like that, you make it sound like if we don't get involved, it's not already a world war. When Israel, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Jordan, Hezbollah, Iran, and Syria are already involved, it's already a war going on it in the Middle is, East. But there's a big difference between unleashing the dogs of war and having the dogs chewing on the edges. And once we unleash the dogs of war in that big, uh, in that big an area and with the resources that are there, you have a conflict that is going to be a worldwide disaster. Yeah, see, I think the dogs have already been unleashed. I think they're barking, I think they're biting, and I think they're killing. Well, because we haven't destroyed anything economically yet. And Are you, you kidding me? War, Syria almost doesn't... Wait, wait, Syria almost doesn't exist anymore. Aleppo, the largest city, I'm is not in ruins. I'm talking about Syria. I'm talking about every other country that would be involved and be attacked. I'm talking about supplying the, the world with half of its oil. You know, you have a world war going on in that area. You are going to paralyze the country. You talk about a depression. You're talking about the United Holy States? Cow. You hurt our economy? Yes. Do you, think, do you think we don't need their oil yet? Do you think we're independent? No, I don't think no. we're independent. But look, Saudi Arabia's got, it, it supports us on this. They've got plenty of oil. they got more than enough to match anything Russia gives us. Yeah, I'm not worried Iran about that. And, if you have Iran fighting on Saudi Arabia and Turkey fighting Saudi Iran and everything else, I mean, this is, this is not just a backyard fight. But it's already happening. That's, I guess, where you and I no, disagree, Terry. No, it's not Terry. happening militarily. It's happening in Syria. And it's happening right. politically. Right. And it's happening with little... And it's happening things. in Lebanon, too, by the way, not just Syria. Yeah. It's already spilled yeah. over to there. But it's not got the major countries heavily involved openly with troops on the ground, et cetera. Russia's... Not, I, I, okay, now, uh, so let me be clear here. I'm not supporting troops on the ground. I'm not supporting United States troops on the ground. I'm not supporting... Uh, and I don't think we need to have troops on the ground. You I realize we've said that about every single war we've ever been in, including World War II? We didn't put troops on the ground in Kosovo. That's my <laughs> example. And we had very few troops on the ground in Libya. Uh, now, you, I mean, Iraq and Af see, here's here's what I think is going on here. It's, it's very interesting to me that you mentioned Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, I and I think the American people are right with you, Terry. I do. I, I admit I'm outside public opinion here because people say, well, this is the same as Iraq. This is it, it's not the same as Iraq. In Iraq, we invaded a country that didn't want us there. And we did so largely for oil revenue and things like that. Here, the people are begging us not to send troops and we should never send troops, but to stop the Syrian Air Force from bombing its own people. And uh, I think they're, they're already getting very, very angry at us. How do you do that? Hey, guys, I'm, I'm back. Sorry, I lost you there for a few yeah, seconds. Yeah, where have you been? Thought, no, no, Garland, we, we solved the problems. Where have you been? But I should have known. I, why, I need to turn on CNN and uh, I'll see a banner across. Yeah, Syrian, yeah, we, Syrian problems solved on We Act Radio. <laughs> so there is, there I is see the banner now. I think Garland was running and hiding from the hard discussion is what was really <laughs> happening yeah, here. Yeah, you guys, you know me that. Well, uh, apparently. Well, I, I, you, you, you lucked out because it's the end of my 20 minutes. So we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to move into Terry's topic. Uh, something about slavery in Bangladesh sounds oh, yeah. pretty scary. We'll be right back with more of the Raucous Caucus coming up right after this. You're listening to WPWC, We Act Radio, 1480 AM, weactradio.com. Hello, my name is Jim Gray, and I am a judge of the Superior Court in California and a former federal prosecutor in Los Angeles. I would like to talk to you for a moment about marijuana. Did you know that since the federal government first banned marijuana in 1937, usage in this country has actually gone up by about 4,000 percent? Or did you know that in the Netherlands, where adults are allowed to possess small amounts of marijuana and buy it from government-regulated businesses, fewer adults and fewer teenagers smoke marijuana than here in our country? Or that an American is arrested on marijuana charges every 38 seconds? If you are wondering if any of this makes sense, you are not alone. 
To find out more, contact the Marijuana Policy Project at 1-877-JOIN-MPP or visit them on the web at mpp.org. Thank you and good luck to us all. You're listening to WPWC, We Act Radio, 1480 AM, weactradio.com. Back to the Rockus Caucus. This is Mark Levine with uh, the newly found Garland Nixon. Are you there, sir? I am here. Okay, and also Terry DeKester, you are there. Oh, you better believe it. Garland, what happened to you? Uh, I got a, uh, a fun around with my phone there, and I think I uh, accidentally restarted it. <laughs> Garland has yet to learn about modern technology. All right, that, that's fine. Now, Terry, um, uh, someone who's also living in the past, that's a terrible segue, but I'm doing my best, uh, <laughs> is, is Bangladesh. Uh, there's still slavery there? Tell me about that. Well, I think it has to do with part of this is inspired because, and just give me a minute here, it's inspired because uh, I have begun to um, perform it once again in reenactments as Tobias Lear, George Washington's um, aide-de-camp and secretary, and therefore the slavery issue constantly comes up in the presentations that I'm doing. Right. Now, we know you're old enough to remember slavery. We get it. But uh, yeah, is, is yeah. there still, is <laughs> there still you, slavery yeah. in Bangladesh? What, what? Yeah. Because I thought is, it was, I thought it was just a nasty labor dispute. But you're actually yeah, saying it's yeah. slavery. That's what that's what we would love to think, wouldn't it? We tend to think of slavery, you know, as, as, as in the historic context only that we were involved in, with you know African Americans being shipped over by hundreds and ships and all of that, and Ch- whips and slave chains, auctions and everything else, which is certainly part of the picture. But what slavery is, and I'm so proud of uh, Pope Francis for um, bringing this up. Slavery still exists because slavery is nothing more than commerce run amok. And that's exactly what's happening here worldwide, whether it's just stripping all the way from unions. There's no doubt, and we said it before on this show, that if private industry has the option of just use having slave labor, they will take so, that So option. be specific, Terry. Tell us exactly what's going on in Bangladesh right now. Well, what's going on in going on in Bangladesh. It's American companies that basically are supporting the whole billion-dollar, two-billion-dollar industry of garment production in Bangladesh. We are the ones. We Americans are the ones. Our companies, our government... Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, are the ones saying, sure, you can pay people 18 cents an hour, put them in totally unsafe conditions, let them get 500 and some odd killed, and not give a damn because we've got another place right next door that we can do the same thing to the people. Is that any different from what American companies are doing in China, India, or Mexico? No. Okay, so there's basically slavery in all those countries. We will always go towards, companies will always go towards the cheapest possible labor they can get. And if that means enslaving people or oppressing people, at any degree, in any way, they will do it. So who's the criminal in here? Yes, the people in Bangladesh didn't do enough, but the real criminal are the commerce people that drove the situation, which was the same situation in the United States 200, 300 years ago. It wasn't that the British government went around saying, let's have slaves. It's the East India Tea Company, etc. Etc. It's the sugar companies. It's all these private organizations, private money-making, profit-making organizations that drive oppression and suppression of the human race. And the other day, last show, a couple shows ago, we were talking about not going to Walmart. So fine, I made the pledge. I go to Costco. I buy a pair of jeans. I bring them home. Where the hell are they made? Bangladesh. Bangladesh. You're right. You can't win for losing. Garland. No, but I mean, this is a worldwide problem. And now there's the immigration policy in the United States, which has gone from pluralism, populism, to bringing in only specified, highly qualified people because we've got the cheap labor out there in some other countries and we don't have to worry about it. And this is a moral, political, and economic issue that we have to face. Let me bring Garland in here. Go ahead, Garland. Uh, Terry brings up a really good point that we don't talk about. There's a term that's used, um, particularly in developing countries, that is called brain drain. Whereas companies, uh, countries such as the United States and the developed countries, actually drain the the intellectuals and the um, the the uh, skilled uh, people, uh, you know, and, 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 and knowledgeable and skilled uh, labor and 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 uh, workforce from the country. So you know, whether it's India or Bangladesh or wherever, our policies are moving towards saying, well, if you are a poor person 
um, we are, we won't take you. But if you're a doctor or if you're someone that could have have a you know tremendous benefit to that particular society, well, we'll take you and let those people suffer, which is in itself uh, unethical and, more, and, and, and immoral. But but I think this all goes together for this reason. It, 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 when you think back, if you were in you know 1800 and you were buying you know cheap cotton garments that were made in in, in the New York area because at that time we we kind of worldwide we controlled the market in cotton garments because we got slave we had slave labor so if you were buying that you're supporting it one of the issues is consumerism we want all this cheap stuff and we're willing to turn our heads we will look at these horrible things ha- that happen and we'll turn our heads and at least Terry and I, you know, we've discussed on this show making an attempt to avoid this stuff when possible, as hard as it is. But most people out here just simply say, well, let me go find the cheapest stuff. Oh, it's horrible what's happening in Bangladesh. Oh, wait a minute. This is only fourteen ninety I'm not going to read where it's made. It's, there's consumerism. It's all working yeah, together. Yeah, but here, here's the problem. It seems to me that in a country where uh, some 93% of the wealth earned since uh, George Bush was chosen president by the Supreme Court in 2000, some 93% of that wealth went to the top 1%, with the other 7% uh, generously distributed among the other 99%, mostly to the top 2 and 3%. Uh, in that case, we have middle class wages stagnant going down, obviously a few very rich people making enormous sums of money. So the American people are poor, so they say, you know, the people in Bangladesh, they're poor, or the people in Walmart right here in America are earning very low wages, but I'm poor too, so I have to go. So basically what you have is a few very rich people in the United States and around the world, but, but uh, larger in the United States, making us all fight each other, making the 99% fight the 99% here in this country because Walmart's cheap, but they mistreat their workers, fighting the 99.9% in Bangladesh and India and China. So what's interesting is that I I understand a middle-class American saying, look, I I can only afford $14.99. I can't afford the $18.99 that it costs for Made in America. And the irony is they're basically causing us to fight amongst ourselves, this very, very small group of privileged people. You you make an excellent point, Mark, and one thing people should read is prior to the revolution Revolutionary War and afterwards, for that matter, but depending exactly on how you count it, between 90 and 95 percent of Americans were living in poverty. Between 90 and 95 percent were in poverty, and that is deliberate. That is not something that happens by accident, and it's becoming deliberate now because yes, the American public and the and this is around the world. This is happening. The middle classes' wages are being pushed further and further and further down, which therefore justifies paying laborers somewhere else to decrease their wages further and further down. And you are pushed. All you're really doing, as you pointed out, is we're feeding the top one percent. We're feeding the top one, maybe two, maybe three, maybe even twenty percent. But eighty percent of the people in this country and the world are in a downhill trend that is being pushed by private industry with government collusion. And somehow this really has to be identified. We are pushing and creating a, uh, what we call, what, uh, what Pope Francis called, legal slavery. And that's all it boils down to, where the worker is totally dispensable. But when we're all fighting each other, uh, American poor and middle class people are fighting the, the poor of Bangladesh and India and China and Mexico, and basically 99.9% of the world's population is fighting amongst itself for the tiny yeah. little bit of wealth that's allowed uh, all of us. Uh, I mean, Garland, what's the way out? What, what solution is out there? Well, you know, uh, uh, Mark, uh, that is a uh, very significant question there, and God only knows if I had the answer, uh, you know, I, I, I'd certainly uh, put it forth. I'm sure Terry does, but I don't. But <laughs> <laughs> I like to ask the questions that I myself can't answer. See, that's, that's, yeah, that's, that's, part, that's, that's but, part of my yeah. trick. See, but I get point, a question I can't answer, I throw it out to y'all, and, I'm, and I sound really smart because I've asked a tough question, and uh, then you can't answer it, and I, I win twice. So that's, the point that's been made here is that as we look at Bangladesh as, as, as you know, uh, a, 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 a uh, capitalist slavery country that is, you know, uh, happens as a result of the the the, the um, uh, uh, um, appetite, worldwide appetite for cheap goods. Um, the point that you made about what's happened and what our economy has been co- has has become demonstrates that we are in fact becoming Bangladesh. We are, you know, there are different degrees of what Bangladesh is. You know, we, these kind of feudalistic societies where there's a tiny, tiny group of very wealthy people and everyone else is um, poor or peasants or serfs. We are identical 
to Bangladesh. We are identical to these countries that are doing this. We are just on a different degree. If everybody in a country has a thousand dollars, I mean, if a tiny group in a country has a thousand dollars and everyone else has one dollar, or if ever, uh, if if if, every, if if a tiny group in a country has a hundred thousand and everybody has one thousand, it's the same thing. It's just a different degree. So we need to be concerned and we need to recognize we are no different. Then so, but let me throw it back at you. At a, at a level, different level. How can you tell somebody not to go to Walmart or not to buy a garment that's fourteen ninety nine made in Bangladesh uh, when the made in USA is more expensive? You can say to a rich liberal, "Sure, don't harm people. You know, be good. Uh, we, we 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 can't let people suffer. Who you know? But uh, you're talking about a, a, a someone who's struggling to get by in America, which is at least half the country, if not more. Uh, then aren't we just sort of having poor people or lower middle class people fight each other? Well, we're stuck in that situation, and it's what the Occupy movement, as weak as it was, was all about. And there was a brief moment there when people were beginning to recognize the reality. You know, we are still the wealthiest, most powerful nation in the world. Not for much longer, but we are. <laughs> you know, and at that, we do have enormous political, economic, moral force if we take moral attitudes, if we don't destroy our moral capital. One of the things we should be doing is demanding that our companies here make sure that some regulations and some degree of safety and maybe even some degree of wage is you know, provided for by, comp- by them outsourcing to other places. We can set the standard, but we've got to become aware of the fact that we're talking about today of what is happening to all of us and that this is a real economic problem. It comes down to, again, supporting the common good, then the common good worldwide, as opposed to just me, the individual. And if we don't start thinking about that and realizing that we are being exploited, that we are being pushed into a situation of fighting each other for the, for the crumbs, so, you know, let them eat cake, you know, if we don't realize that, then we are going to wind up exactly the same situation. So what's the answer? Take back our government? Uh, yes. Yes, I'm take back the but be honest and open about it. I mean, you know, again, what Americans don't do, and I just saw a brilliant play about this, which you guys I recommend highly, and I wish I could remember the name of it. I'd tell you about it. But anyway, it's played Broadway and everywhere else. The point is we don't talk about the real issues. We don't talk about We don't say things as bold as Pope Francis said, that the United States of America is supporting slavery in Bangladesh. We have to say these things. We have to be honest and open and bold with these things so that we realize what the consequences are. Can I be honest and open and bold here? And, and, and I, I, have a, I have a startling admission. I did not hear Pope Francis say this. Uh, no. what, was this in the newspapers? I, I, oh, I, don't, yes. no, I really don't doubt you, Terry. I'm not. But my yes. point is that this, this hasn't gotten a lot of press. That I, you're I, damn right it doesn't. They don't want it to get press. Yes, Pope Francis, it was in a private... Um, well, I'm not sure what the name for it was, but an association with a, oh. a number of people, a religious moment, you know, a spiritual moment, a spiritual discussion. I, he was leading, and talking. they got talking about Bangladesh, and he came up, he said, "With this is, you know, atrocious, this is horrible, this is legal slavery. The significance of that statement, besides him just saying it, is that the Vatican immediately published it. That is significant, and this is one rare leader who's not tied yes. to corporations who can say such things, uh, but uh, I somehow I don't hear many Catholic Americans repeating that assertion. Garland, well, you know, people don't want to face that fact. We don't want to face the fact that, geez, there's something wrong with me wearing these jeans that I'm wearing right now that were made in Bangladesh. Oh, I thought it's just because they don't look good on you, Terry. I didn't really want to tell you that. Um, but <laughs> Oh, don't you wish we had television? <laughs> I look wonderful today. Well, I have a video of me. I mean, we got to get y'all on Skype uh, so yes, we can. Yes. Let me bring Garland in here. Garland, uh, does the Pope, does that change anything? I don't know. I hope so. You know, but one of the things Terry just said I want to co- comment on, and, and it's something I believe strongly in, and that is when he mentioned we need to take our government back. And 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 you and and, you, and um, I started saying that when I heard the Tea Party members yelling, "We want our country back," and my answer was, "You never had it." Um, and when he, Terry says we need to take our government back, I think we need to face the realization that we never had it. We right. have a government that was that is always, and I think that's part of facing it. It's always been run by an elite wealthy class and you know it's it's a club that we're not in and i think we need to recognize that because it's really closing in on us and um, you know now so more than ever um we are on a track for a completely feudal society and no excuse me we're there 
And so I think we need to recognize it's not about necessarily taking our country back. It's about recognizing that we never had it and that the only way we can change things, we need, and I don't mean this in a militaristic sense, we need a revolutionary change um, in the way we think. And I, and, and, and I think that the only thing that's going to bring that, unfortunately, is the level of economic pain that's coming for the 93% um, will eventually get so, the status quo will get so bad that nothing else, uh, you know, no, nothing else that can happen will seem a lot worse, and unfortunately that's when we'll change, but we're heading for Bangladesh. Well, I think what you're saying, Garland, unfortunately, is that Mitt Romney was right when he said that uh, corporations are people, because I think what he was saying then is when Abraham Lincoln said that government of the people, by the people, and for the people right, shall not yes. perish from the earth, he was really talking about corporations, so it all makes sense to me now. Thank you for clarifying that. All right. Well, when we come back, I want to get to some some uh, wild conspiracy theories. We've talked about real massacre in Syria and real slavery in Bangladesh, but Garland wants to talk about all the things that aren't occurring and that make us all so very upset. If you want to call in and join this discussion, you can at 202-889-9797. 202-889-9797. This is Mark Levine and the Rockus Caucus, and we'll be right back right after this. You're listening to WPWC We Act Radio, 1480 AM, weactradio.com. Does your child have difficulty controlling their anger or a history of academic failure in school? Options Public Charter School offers a therapeutic learning environment with small classroom sizes and on-site counseling services to help students succeed. Options PCS is now enrolling grades 5 through 11 for the upcoming school year. For more information, call Options PCS today at 202-547-1028. Options Public Charter School, exceptional education for exceptional students. You're listening to WPWC We Act Radio, 1480 AM, weactradio.com. Welcome back to the Rockus Caucus. This is Mark Levine with... Terry Nixon. Nixon. And Garland Nixon. <laughs> they, I, they always speak at once. That's, that's part of the fun that you get to do. See, I'm here in, in We Act Radio Studios right here in Washington, D.C., and then they're both on the phone. So I can just say with, and then they both speak at once. It's kind of like watching Laurel and Hardy buttheads. It's, one of the, it's beautiful, too, though. It, it proves that Garland and I are unified. Uh, that's right. And that you both one want... One spirit. <laughs> yes. Uh, and uh, so that, that's at least my conspiracy that I just caused. Uh, I, I don't, <laughs> uh, Garland, you've got some more interesting conspiracy theories. Tell me about those. Well, a couple things real quick on conspiracy theories. If we look back in history, and we, you know, the um, the the conspiracy theories in in the late 1800s and early to mid 1900s about Catholics and how they were coming, you know, the Pope, et cetera, they were going to take over our country. Um, you know, was used to to, to to justify the persecution of Catholics in the right. U.S. The conspiracy theories about Jews and gold and the bankers were used by the Nazis and the anti-Semites in Europe during the during the, during the, the you know the early uh, part right. of the century. The um, conspiracy theories uh, have been used against so many groups: Asians, so, blacks, Latinos. I can name a conspiracy theory for every. The Irish back in the eighteen yeah. hundreds. Right. There are so, even conspiracy uh, against conspiracies. Not to mention McCarthy. I mean, he had all the conspiracies. Communists, right? Right. Well, the guy, that candy maker guy uh, named Welsh, who said that um, Eisenhower was a communist and his brother was his boss in the Communist Party and all this craziness. So we, we can talk about conspiracy theories, but I think we should keep in mind that they are very dangerous and they have been used by some very nasty people for, vener- for, for, for nefarious reasons over the course of history. But I'll say this right now, we have, and, and what brought it to my attention is some Facebook friends. Sandy Hook was all staged. What? That was, that was a oh, false no. flag. No way. Frogs and bombings. That was false flag. This is the term they use, false flag operation. That was the government. Everything that has happened, it's interesting. The, 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 the bombings were on TV, and, and I barely knew what happened, and I looked on Facebook, and there were these people saying, it's obvious that the government has done this, and they um, had, you know, 
still pictures of like some fuzzy thing in the background saying, see, that proves it. Um, and I think we are in a wow. time now. Wow. Where, I, see, um, I understand why the NRA doesn't want people to think Newtown occurred. And I understand maybe why Tsarnaev's aunt and uncle in, you know, in Russia or their parents don't want to believe this occurred. But if you don't have a vested interest in in not having events occur and you know cameras are around the world are recording this thing plus it wasn't just cnn and 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 uh, headline news and msnbc and fox and and every and local stations it was individuals sending out photos uh, i had a friend who ran in the boston marathon i mean sending out tweets people i mean how can people deny such obvious reality because they well, don't want that, to in the first place well you know one of the things that's happening here too and i'm sure you've read about it was the vigilante of the social vigilanteism of the social media, in that people put out, you know, faces and pictures and names of people that they thought were the bombers, and some of these people actually got harassed, and some of these people actually got arrested, and it was nothing more than social media mayhem. So people, I mean, the real message here is social media is as dangerous as it is beautiful, and we've got to realize that. Garland, what do you think is going on? Yeah, but the other thing is, Mark, uh, what you're saying, I, you know, is uh, I believe it was Voltaire that said any belief that is not founded in logic and reason will not be swayed by it. When you say start giving us these rational reasons why these conspiracy uh, theories, some of them don't make sense, um, you're wasting your time because with these people, with, with these conspiracy theories, and it, 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 it's become like a growing movement in America, and it, it's alarming to me because... Everything now is a conspiracy theory. It's the, I mean, the government, God only knows, did absolutely everything. And, um, yeah, it, it's, to me, it's, it's, it's uh, I think, a result of um, people being afraid, people seeing these large entities such as corporations take control, people feeling the loss of control in their life and being afraid. And they can come up with all these conspiracy theories, and they can say, there is someone that I can say is responsible for this. Um, these aren't just random acts. Somebody's responsible, and we can hold somebody accountable, and somebody can be punished, and I can be less afraid. But See, it's become I, pathological. I remember after September 11th, all the people that claimed that the United States government had set charges to take down the World Trade Center, that, 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 that there was no plane that flew into the Pentagon, despite the fact that there's video of plane flying into the Pentagon, I, I, you know, and, and there's video of planes flying in the World Trade Center. And, and because the Bush-Cheney regime used 9-11 for their own nefarious purposes, which they clearly did, people said, aha, the fact that they used this horrible tragedy for their own nefarious ends means that they set the charges in the first place. One doesn't follow from the other. Sometimes bad people take advantage of awful situations. That doesn't necessarily mean that they, that they started those. And so you get these on the left, you get them on the right, and I guess I need to ask you, Garland, uh, who are your Facebook friends? Because, uh, <laughs> you know, I, most of the people that I normally associate with don't believe this nonsense, so Maybe maybe uh, you need to hang out with a better class of people. I don't know what, what am I. Uh, I mean, seriously, Garland. Who who? Uh, I think the people who believe this tend to be the more marginalized of our society, who've had some really hard times, some hard knocks, and maybe um, you know are, are crying. It's a cry for help, I guess, isn't it? Well, I, I think two things. Number one. I think initially, yeah, you know, I mean, there are people who I would classify to the level of some sort of um, paranoia and mental illness. Sure. At some point. It go, you know, with some of these absurd conspiracy theories. And they're on the left and the right. I don't think this is a, a, a yeah. liberal conservative thing. The fact that it is growing, um, it, it's growing, you know, because if you read uh, Richard Hofstadter's The pa Paranoid Style, when he talks about The Paranoid Style, which is a great essay, one of the things he discusses is the fact that there are pe the, the issue that there are people who seem otherwise normal and are otherwise in their lives per perfectly normal that will grasp some really absurd conspiracy theories. But I do believe that what is happening with, as a result of this kind of corporate takeover of, of world of our governments worldwide, I do think that is fueling the fear of average people, and it is making people who would not otherwise believe in some of these more absurd conspiracy theories, who are afraid, who or they all, everybody now works for a corporation. Everybody's afraid they're going to get laid off on any given day, and that the the, the um, officers of the corporation are going to take a five million dollar bonus because they laid off all of their employees, which ha which happens every day. I think that is fueling the paranoid movement. 
See, well, here's, yeah, here's it's, my it's concern. Also, it's also, yeah. though, guys, you know, you know, this is a real social, psychological problem that somehow the, the country and individuals have to face. We are caught in a time and an era that is incredibly, increasingly more and more complex. And the more complex it gets, and the more threatening, therefore, it gets, and the more powerless we feel, mm-hmm. therefore, the more we seek simple answers. And you brought up the idea of, the, uh, of 9-11. Um, I hate to mention it was a radio station that I was closely, intimately associated with for years, <laughs> and broadcasting for years, excuse me. <coughs> Sorry about that. Where I guarantee you I was the only person, and I was doing it with scientific evidence, and including having worked in a lab myself, studying concrete and compression of concrete, et cetera, et cetera. I was the only one at that particular radio station that was dismissing or refuting any of the conspiracy theories at 9-11. Everybody else, I won't say 100%, but almost everybody else on the air was pushing the conspiracy theories about 9-11. Let me, let me tell you my concern. It has to do with 9-11 conspiracy theories or conspiracy theories about Newtown or the Boston bombing or any of these theories. Here's my concern. There are real bad things happening out there. Yep. Terry, We just did. Uh, you just mentioned slavery in, Bla- in Bangladesh. You just did an episode on all the way you know, corporations are basically enslaving workers. We've done stories on Walmart, Garland. In, in the aftermath of September 11th, I was still talking about the theft of our election in 2000, which was a conspiracy, but it was real. A conspiracy, yep. of course, is when a group of people get together behind in secret and do nefarious things. In this case, the Supreme Court openly said, you know, we don't like that Gore won the election. Let's put in Bush instead, and we don't need any law to back it up. Now, that was happening, and then nine months later came September 11th, and what always happens with the conspiracy theories is they drown out the legitimate, horrible yes. conspiracies going on. There is money. There's the Koch brothers buying the LA Times. That's a terrible thing. There's yep. all the money going on in our politics. There is the fact that the Supreme Court stole an election. There are all these awful things going on, and what I found would happen when, and I was on the radio back in 03. I'm coming up on my 10-year anniversary, actually, in June in radio, uh, but when I was it on makes the, you what twenty seven? Uh, that makes me twenty seven, right? Because yeah. again, I was seventeen. Thank you, yeah. thank you for that, Terry. Uh, yeah. But um, the point was, is that what they would do is first they throw out the stupid conspiracy theory that you know Dick Cheney was laying bombs at the World Trade Center. Dick Cheney's evil, but he's evil in much more secretive ways. Thank you yeah. very much. Uh, th- you know that that he, and then people would say, you know, this idea that uh, the World Trade Center was blown up by Dick Cheney, that uh, George Bush stole the election, that Wall. Walmart is somehow evil, that climate change somehow exists, that Newtown didn't exist, and that the moon landing didn't happen, and what they do is they mix legitimate, real, progressive concerns about real, awful things going on in the world with these crazy conspiracy theories, and it's a great way to dismiss them all. Bush didn't steal the election because you're crazy if you think September 11th wasn't caused by Al-Qaeda. And, and that's my... And so I tell people on the left, you're harming the cause. You don't yes. do any any good by saying Bush and Cheney secretly put put explosives in the World Trade Center that doesn't help us fight Bush and Cheney it harms us because it makes all of us making legitimate arguments against them look like we're crazy too I think we're always looking Terry, for that simple answer I was going to say I think what Terry said uh, brings up the kind of bridges the connection there also because the feeling of powerlessness you know, these things are connected. All these terrible, frightening things are happening, you know, uh, going on. And um, generally, you know, I've read a lot on conspiracy theories lately, and one of the connections is exactly what Terry said, people feeling powers, well, powerlessness, people feeling that they have no power over their own lives. And this gives them some, uh, you know, ironically, paradoxically, it gives them the feeling of control when they can believe in these conspiracy theories. You know, it's very paradoxical that someone can say there's some shadowy conspiracy theory and now I feel in control. But they can bond with people who feel similar and... They can believe that there's not, nothing is random now. You know, it gets to the point with these conspiracy theories that absolutely nothing that happens is random. We've got people who believe there's a guy, David, I think it's Icky, I C K E, and he's the one that's going around uh, arguing that the Illuminati are 12 foot lizard people. <laughs> who are, uh, it's, it's amazing. He's who completely are, you know, wrong. They're only 11 feet tall. I mean, come on, let's not exaggerate here. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And if I'm not mistaken, I think Terry's one of them. So I, 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 I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be surprised. We've outed Terry with blue jeans. 
Yeah, he didn't seem that tall to me, but well, li- li- lizard like, I'll, I'll, I'll grant you that. <laughs> they wore blue jeans from Bangladesh. I think right. the, the arrow's pointing to Terry, Mark. All yeah. right, all right, fair but enough. Let, but, let, but let me add to that because it's significant what's going on here. Is one of the problems that we really are facing in this complex society is, in fact, the destruction of community. We form community on the web, which is not community, because what community means, whether it's with your family or with your neighbors, is you are engaging with people that you find out you don't like everything about them, but that's okay because you have common bonds and common interests. And so therefore you put up with the fact that they pick their nose when you're trying to discuss big political issues. Whatever it is, community involves this interaction between humans, and we are being pushed further and further away from true community. And I mean specifically in terms of everything we've been talking about, whether it's conspiracies or labor or whatever. For instance, if you have a union, and you belong to a union, and you work with union members, you're not going to like everybody in the union. You're not going to agree with half of the people in the union, but you're going to be united, and you're going to be getting information fed back to you. You're going to get cross-fertilization of intellectual ideas, et cetera, et cetera, and then you can evaluate things. But when you just sit on your computer and social media, you can say, yes, Sandy Hook was a government-driven farce by Martians. See, Terry, I'm really glad you're attacking social media because that's a great segue. The inside scoop at 1.30 we're going to have to offer. <laughs> Henry Sinkowitz who's going to come on the air and talk about some of these dangers of social media and, uh, and how we have to. So thank you for that segue. I, I, I appreciate your planning that. And uh, yes, uh, he's, yes. he'll, he'll be on at 1.30 on the inside scoop. So listen Make sure up. he sends me my check. Listen up for that. I'll, I'll ask him to do that. Definitely. Okay. That's the other thing, too, I guess, that's probably that I didn't think about that Terry brought up that's fueling it. Now we have the Internet. So the fact of the matter is when, um, uh, you know, as soon as there's a bombing, some psycho can, you know, take these uh, stills that they get off of, you know, still frames that they get off of TV or whatever, and they can Photoshop them or manipulate them or, you know, point to an arrow to some guy standing there. I saw one. This is, this is going to kill me. to kill you. They, po- they, had a, they had some woman running from the bombing. And they had a picture yep. of a woman that was on CNN. And they said, this is the same woman who is the principal at Sandy Hook. She's an actress. And oh, she's my been a God. Of all these, you know, I mean, really just absurd stuff. But here's the problem. Within minutes after these things happen, it hits the Internet. It goes through these, you know, neurotic psychotic communities of people and they spread this stuff out and um, it, it's just it's, I mean if you really pay attention to this the people are you know we're ignoring it a lot it's really getting out of hand and I suspect some of the things that we see some of the violent acts sometimes that we see uh, some of it may be as a result of some of these kooky things well you have on. a good point because I think that it, I mean we still don't know all the all the details of what radicalized Tamerlan and, and, and Jokar at Sarnayev but apparently the internet is is, is probably exactly. one of them well, we'll find out you know they're going and they're looking at this radical stuff on the internet I remember uh, as long ago as 05 or 06 when I first got the email that said that Al Gore uh, failed to finger uh, Osama bin Laden as a terrorist uh, and it turned out that, it, that Ali North said so and then you go and you actually look at the reality he was talking about Abu Nida which was a completely different terrorist but at that time I had relatives sending this email all around I, I happen to have a few relatives who sad to say are of the conservative persuasion I, I've tried to I begged them to change but but the point is that these false things started going around the internet and that's when I learned the wonderful website Snopes.com which yeah. actually is around to to uh, defangle these defangle is that a word to untangle and defang is I guess what I meant to say uh, the, these these horrible uh, lies and conspiracies that that are out there and so um the, well, that's the real problem. That's the real problem, Mark. Because I mean, I have relatives that I, you know, I'm very close to, and you know, uh, uh, are, hold, hold on, I, we, hang on, hang on. We're finishing up this radio show, oh, and you'll be on in okay, just a second. Okay, Mark. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry, this is yeah. my next guest, uh, but but go go ahead, uh, Derek. Yeah, just you know, I have some relatives and brothers, and I think that are you know very intelligent, very successful people, and but at the same time, they don't look beyond what they want to believe. And, you know, what I try to persuade people at the very least is if you read anything on the Internet, if you read that the sun rose this morning, check it. Double check it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You cannot take the... And this is what's really sad, and it's being pushed by one other factor, which I want to bring in real quick, and it's, it's frightening to me because it's part of the same problem, even though it may not sound like this. Added, this new procedure we have 
where everything we hear about, be it about weapons or be it about um, you know, chemical weapons or whatever, you get this wonderful quote, the U.S. officials spoke on condition of anonymity because they were not authorized to discuss the matter publicly. In other words, we don't even have responsible people taking responsibility for what is being said, quote, officially. We have this random condemnation, this random judgments by people. We don't even know who the heck they are. It's all part of the same game of not taking the time to double-check, triple-check everything. Well, he, let, me, let me throw this in there, too, because yeah. this is very important. You know, a few months back, Michelle Bachman said that she thought that there was going to be, there may be re-education camps for our youth in America. Wow. We had some kooky Republican the other day say that um, the government is buying up all of the, um, uh, the, the bullets so that we can't use them to defend ourselves from the government. <laughs> So you've got these Tea Party people and these crazy people who, for the, who I would like to say that they're doing it for political reasons. Unfortunately, I think they really believe this stuff. Yes. So you well, well, let me ask you this question. Though. We only got a couple of minutes left, so let me just pose this one last question to you on this, and then that's this. We live in an age of social media. We live in an age, and this is a great segue to what's coming up next in the Inside Scoop, which is discussion with Syrian activists who are protesting in front of the White House. We can't get legitimate press into Syria because the Syrian government kills them all. So we rely on Twitter. We rely on Skype. We rely on YouTube videos taken of action in the streets. At the same time as legitimate people uh, are putting out real reporting that that, that actually, you know, CNN reporters can't get to. We also have wild and crazy people putting out conspiracy theories and using these same media tweets and YouTube to put out crazy notions. So my, my last question, uh, let me end it with you, Garland, since you started this. How do we determine what's true and what's not true? So the bottom line is there has to be, you know, some level of, uh, of reality um, you know, it, it's about the person who's reading it. I think a lot of these conspiracy theories aren't about the conspiracy theory itself. It's about the person who's reading it, their psychological profile. And it, they kind of take advantage of people who are already somewhat weak-minded, paranoid, and, 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 and very much frightened. So, so Terry, just, how do you tell the difference between what's true and what's false? You just need to have the father that I had, who told me at the very, very, you know, long time ago, back in the Stone Age, right? He said, Terry, he said, Terry, you believe half of what you read, <laughs> half of what you see, nothing of what you hear. I think at the end of the day, you have to go by what has worked in the past. You know, the New York Times has generally gotten it right. Not always, but when they don't get it right, they issue a correction, and this is a source you can trust. Yeah, only after we've gone to a war in Iraq. We, I, got to, you know, I tell you something. If, if a friend of mine tells me something and that friend is generally truthful, then generally I can believe them. And if well, a friend of mine lies to me a lot, then that's the guy I'm not going to believe. And, and at the, end the of New the, York Times is part of the conspiracy, along with you and Terry, I might add. Uh, you know, Garland, I think you, by bringing this up, have hidden your own... Uh, conspiracy-minded thing, and that was a very clever thing to do, but I'm not falling <laughs> for it. So, yeah, well, my big conspiracy is I'm getting younger and younger, and you guys don't even know it. Uh, you know, after you leave, I think after you live past 100, it flips, right? Like on the car, <laughs> and the yeah, odometer, and that's it why does. you think you're young, you think yeah. you're 23, you're actually 323. I'll so see I, you on the slope, kid. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. Alright, thank you gentlemen for coming here on the Rockets Caucus. Coming up next is the Inside Scoop. Uh, we're gonna, we got a lot going on there. We've got uh, the issue in Syria, and what the United States should do there. We've got whether or not we should be uh, unentangled from the internet, and we have my own comments on the first uh, pro basketball player to come out as gay, Jason Collins. So a terrific show coming up. Uh, then the inside scoop right after this. Thank you, Mark. You're listening to WPWC, We Act Radio, 1480 AM, weactradio.com. Hello, this is Julia Louis-Dreyfus, and I want to tell you about my new favorite discovery, Yosemite National Park. I recently went there with my husband and children, and we walked the trails to see the breathtaking waterfalls, admired the grand meadows, and giant sequoias. But the future of our national parks is uncertain. Many challenges face our parks today, from polluted air and water to development threats outside their borders and inadequate funding to protect our national heritage. That's why the National Parks Conservation Association recently completed a decade-long assessment of the challenges facing our national parks – 
along with proposed actions that will ensure our children and grandchildren will be able to enjoy the parks as we have. Our national parks have inspired Americans for nearly 100 years. As we approach the centennial of the National Park Service in 2016, please join us in helping to protect our national park legacy. Find out how at www.mpca.org. You're listening to WPWC, We Act Radio, 1480 AM, weactradio.com. Good afternoon, America. Welcome to the Inside Scoop. Those sounds you hear in the background are those from a protest at the White House by the activists for a free Syria. And uh, who do I have on the line with me now? Nadja, are you there? Is there someone else there? Who's Hi, Mark. Hello. Uh, welcome. Uh, so this is the Inside Scoop. This is Mark Levine. And uh, tell us who you are and what you're doing right now. Um, I am one of the protesters as a Syrian American. I'm trying to uh, give my voice and uh, let, let it be heard by the American people that uh, Syrians are getting killed, uh, getting slaughtered in Syria by their own government. And for the last two years, nothing was done. So last night, we were so happy to see the movement finally, even from Israel. We could not believe what we saw last night. And what happened last night? Well, um, the uh, intelligence and the uh, airplanes, the aircraft uh, from Israel, bombed uh, in Kassiun uh, Mountain. I don't know if people know what, what Kassiun Mountain is. They don't. It, Go uh, ahead. Tell it, us. It, it, it really um, has a lot of uh, uh, all the supporters and uh, the, the military. And some. Uh, we heard also there was a lot of Hezbollah and Iranian soldiers in the mountains hidden and they were also had some chemical weapons because when uh, the aircraft bombed last night it uh, affected the, the smell and the, the, the explosions uh, shook the whole city and Damascus is a huge city is not a small city and every one could uh, could hear the explosions were uh, um, very uh, powerful so let, let me let me give people a little bit of background was, here they, they were yeah. they were saying there were there was uh, uh, a terrible bad smell, which indicates there was kind of chemical weapons in those mount- in the mountains. So let me, let me give people a little background here. If you're just tuning in, uh, I'm sure you know there's a horrible war going on in Syria. Uh, at least 70,000 have been murdered, uh, men, women, and children, according to the United Nations. That is a low estimate. Uh, that is an estimate, actually, that's a, at least a year old now. Yeah, m- multiply it by three or four, because... This is a number, just a confirmed number. That's just a confirmed number. Uh, most people believe it's in the hundreds of thousands. And, Correct. of course, uh, there's been a large question of whether or not we should get involved. I have had uh, Syrian activists, including people from the Syrian Free Army, right here on the Inside Scoop for more than a year now, arguing the United States needs to do something to stop the massacres, and I myself have endorsed a no-fly zone. But moving up to the present, uh, President Obama declared a red line, a uh, what he called uh, it would be a game-changer was his, his word used if Syria were to use chemical weapons against its own people. And now the evidence has come to light from three separate sources, I should say, uh, from the British, the French, and the Israelis have all come forward with evidence of chemical weapons use. And now something, and of course, Jordan has argued that we need to get involved. Jordan is our ally in the Middle East. There's, there's about a million Syrian refugees in Jordan. Turkey, our NATO ally, has said we need to do something to get involved uh, to stop this. And our, our enemies, Russia and Iran and Hezbollah, are, have all been fighting in Syria. Syria, again, against the Syrian people. And I, and I want to emphasize that the people who began this revolution, the people that came on my show a year ago, are peaceful people who just want to have a free Syria. Uh, unfortunately, there has been some infiltration now from al-Qaeda and others because we've done very little. And the question now is what should be done? The red line's been crossed, and even Israel has gotten involved in, in bombing what really was the command and control center uh, for the government. Uh, and and as, uh, as uh, my caller points out, it has included Included what was chemical weapons. So, what what are you protesting for right now? What did, wh- who is the group, and what are you calling for the United States to do? We want the United States to um, destroy more of those chemical weapons to weaken in, uh, the Iranians and the Russians. We know this is a difficult decision to be made. We understand that 
the reason why United States is, and uh, Europe even or Israel uh, did not step in before. It's not an easy thing. Syria is not only the problem, it's the whole region. We understand all this, but what's been happening recently, they crossed the line. This, uh, this uh, lunatic, uh, we can call him Bashar al-Assad and his thugs, did, did really cross the line. What they are doing is ethnic cleansing. They are unhuman. They are entering with Hezbollah, with the help of Hezbollah and Iran, entering villages. They are peaceful villages. They have nothing to do with what's going on. They go and slaughter kids, rape women. Uh, it's unbelievable. Burning people alive, it's just unhuman. We can't believe what's happening. So we need the United States to not only destroy the chemical weapons that they did, we want them to destroy everything that has to do with Assad and his thugs. Seriously, this is cross the line because it's going to not only affect the Syrians, it's affecting the whole region, affecting Lebanon, affecting Jordan, affecting Israel, Turkey, Iraq, everything. You can tell from the news what's going on in Iraq. It's the last, uh, last month was the most killing months and explosions were the most in years in, in Iraq. So there's something going on. And if we don't stop this, it's going to explode and it's going to extend for the whole region, unfortunately. So we do have to do something right away. Now tell me this. You are right now at the White House, correct? Yes, yes. And, and I can get closer to the noises so you can hear it. Yeah, let me hear it. So this is, the, what's the name of the group? Syrian Activist, Free, for Free Syria? That's activists? Um, uh, yes. I- uh, we we call this this group is the the free Syrians. Uh, what do you call this group? <laughs> Activists for free Syria is what I was told. Uh, Activists for free Syria in the Great Washington area. Correct. Okay, let me let me hear some of the noise. How many people are out there at the protest? I would say today. Uh, yeah, we are like 250. 250. And folks, if you want to join in this, right, you'd welcome anyone coming down to the White House right now and joining in your protest. Uh, I'm sorry, say that again. You would welcome others who, who support the cause oh, coming yeah, out and joining in. Welcome with us. And we're not only one group. Actually, we're a combination of other people. It's not only one group. But basically, this is this is the group uh, that uh, basically uh, organized it. Okay, and I can hear some of the noises in the background. Let me ask you some of the difficult questions that I know that President Obama is asking and is largely the reasons he's giving for the United States not being involved. Uh, one of the most difficult questions that always keeps getting asked, and it's a fair question, I think you may agree, is how do we make sure that the weapons go to the right people, to to make sure they go to the innocent Syrians that are being slaughtered and don't go to some of the uh, radical extremist al-Qaeda-like terrorists that are also fighting for the Syrian people, but we want the weapons to go to the good people and not the bad people. How, how, how can um, the United States distinguish between them? I have AJ here on the line, and he's going to answer the question for Okay, you. great. Who am I, who's this? Uh, hello, Mark. This hello. Is Adrian. Adrian, yes. So my question was, how can the United States... Uh, you know I've been a big supporter of your cause for, for uh, over a year I now. That. Uh, I but that. But I, you know there are people in the United States government uh, that are anxious, saying that we're afraid to arm the good Syrian people who are fighting oppression because we're afraid that it will... Um, some of the, the arms will go to some of the radical terrorists. H- how do you respond to those people? Well, there is no doubt by unsecuring the borders all over Syria, there are going to be some radicals who will be penetrating to the country. There is no doubt about that. But I assure you, they are extremely minimal comparing to the defected soldiers who uh, refuse to kill their own people from the regular Syrian army. So I would say this is like 2-3% of them, and they consider this themselves a freedom fighter. They came to, for jihad, and they will be leaving the country after that. That's what they claim so far, as far as I know. But overall, the rebels and the uh, defective soldiers from low ranking to high ranking are in charge of everything. But I just want to mention something about the, the airstrike attack that happened by the uh, Israeli yes, on please do. Some, some targets in Syria yesterday. Yes. Um, it's still not clear what was the intention of it even though it was positive and good because they damaged so much of the artillery that was meant to destroy the Syrian cities. Right. 
So, well, Adrian, you know, how, let me ask you how you feel about that. I mean, Syria and Israel uh, have fought uh, at least three wars against each other for the last uh, 60 years. Uh, they're not exactly normally considered the best of friends. Uh, there's the dispute over the Golan Heights. Do you think that this could foretell a new era once Assad is gone and the Syrian people have taken back their country? Might this actually help build a peaceful future between Syria and Israel? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I'm sure the rebels are reaching out to Israel to assure them that the border will be secure in the uh, moment of the collapse of the regime. And the bottom line for the Israeli, as far as we know, that they need to protect their border. Which right. Is, I don't blame them with that. So and it sounds are, to me like, like this is something where longtime enemies can actually get together against their common foes, the Assad regime and Hezbollah and Iran, and actually uh, lead to a peace that has, has uh, you know, not existed for more than 60 years. That's absolutely right. It's been a myth, and they've been uh, claiming that Israel is an enemy, and technically they are enemy of the Syrian people themselves. And they've been building uh, 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 an army to protect them, not to protect the country, not against Israel. They're uh, uh, a bunch of thugs, liars, and the Syrians has always wanted a normal relationship with the Israeli and, and friendly uh, 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 relation and border with them. But... Uh, that's not going to happen if the Assad regime is still in power because their, uh, uh, their interest with the Iranians in Hezbollah it has been going on for a long time. And, you know, everybody knows the Iranian agenda in the area. Adrian, Secretary of State Kerry met recently with General Idris of the, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. Is it Idris? Idris? Idris, yeah. Idris of the uh, Free Syrian Army. Uh, do you uh, like and respect uh, General Idris? Does, is he someone that represents fairly uh, the Syrian opposition, or, or uh, do you have problems with him as well? Oh, definitely, yeah, they do. I mean, they, they have good coordination, uh, the uh, Free Syrian Army, as far as I know, and, uh, you know, with, with a, a very limited supply of logistics and arms, they're still managing to, uh, you know, control the situation and 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 uh, whatever arms they gain from the regular army the Assad uh, thugs and I'm, I'm sure they are in charge but you know still the help that been promised to be delivered has not received they have not received it well, yet well let's talk about the aid that uh, it's at least it's been reported the united states is giving food and humanitarian aid and medicine and that on its way is what they call non-lethal aid things like body armor and night goggles uh it, it, has that aid been delivered yet or it's it, still on its way i'm sure i'm sure some of it has been delivered but uh, um, you know the Syrian army does not need no food no logistics they need real arms and they have the ability to bring down that regime. But no one has delivered yet. Well, it's, my, it's been reported that Saudi Arabia and Qatar have delivered real arms. Uh, have they, or n not very much? It's extremely limited. Um, and nothing nothing uh, uh, substantial yet. And, uh, and, and, and how can the United States be sure that the arms won't... I mean, they'll be used against the Assad regime, to be sure, but that after the Assad regime falls, which I have no doubt it will fall, uh, it's just a matter of time, that they won't be taken over by some of the radical extremists that then use these weapons against uh, the Americans worldwide. Well, the Obama administration has to reach out into the rebels and get to know them um, uh, exactly who they are, and if Obama has promised and made so many promises so many threats to the Assad regime for crossing a red line that has been crossed already. And uh, we, we don't see anything uh, uh, serious, serious uh, has been done against the Assad regime. We don't know what the reluctance uh, of taking any kind of action. I believe if he gives the green light to the Saudi and Qatari to arm the rebels heavily, they will be getting rid of that regime faster than we can imagine. Let me, let me give you an idea of the reluctance. I don't share it, but I, I, I have to say I'm in the minority. I think the majority of the American people are probably against us doing anything in Syria. And let me tell you why. Again, I don't share this sentiment, but I understand it. Basically, George Bush took us to a war in Iraq that uh, on false pretenses. Uh, he said there were weapons of mass destruction. There were not. And then we not only we didn't help the Iraqi people so much as invade the entire country with U.S. arms and uh, in 
the views, I think, of the majority of Americans, that was a fiasco. That was a terrible mistake. It caused people to be our enemy who were not our enemy before. It didn't do that much good for the people of Iraq. And most importantly, uh, you know, we had troops on the ground who were occupying a foreign nation. I try to explain to Americans how Syria is very different, that we don't have to send troops in. The people of Syria are fighting themselves, that there are chemical weapons here, unlike Iraq, where things weren't proven. How, how can you make your case to people listening to this show right now that helping Syria is very different from what we did in Iraq? Well, it was clear after the Iraq war, after the invasion in 2003, that was raised under uh, false pretenses. But here, that man, that crazy man, that criminal, has used the chemical weapon. You talk about Bashir Assad. I'm sure the international community is aware of the stockpile that Syria has, and it's one of the largest in the Middle East. And what has been done about it? Nothing. Unfortunately, I've heard it from a, a, a former CIA director when the revolt started in Syria that the scenario that happened in Bosnia is going to happen again in Syria. Unfortunately, the, the Syrians are on their own. There are not going to be any international or foreign intervention unless a mass amount of people get killed, which is extremely unfortunate. And as far as we know, and the international community knows, Syria is not extremely rich and old to impact the world price. If, if, if it did, you know what would have happened. Well, uh, that's like also my point, is that we, we intervened in Libya, we intervened in Iraq. Yeah. Both countries have a lot of oil. I feel better about U.S. foreign policy when we intervene to save lives. And if we do intervene in Syria, it would be more like our intervention in Kosovo, where it was simply to stop a massacre and not to get low oil prices. Exactly. Bill Clinton has done that. I don't know why Obama isn't taking the initiative to lead that kind of uh, uh, humanitarian uh, yeah, I, I don't know why either. I think, again, he's he's following the lead of the American people who are tired of our war in, in, in Iraq and in Afghanistan. Uh, I Again, I, I personally would never have. I, did, I was against the war in Iraq, and after Afghanistan, I would have withdrawn maybe after a year. Uh, after we got rid of Al Qaeda there, so uh, it's it's hard for Americans to support yet another Middle Eastern war. Most of them can't place Syria on a map, just like they couldn't place Iraq or Afghanistan, and they don't understand why we should help this country versus any other country when we have when we have problems at home. Can you help persuade someone listening to this show right now why Syria matters and should matter to the ordinary American? Well, we need to prove to the entire world that we can intervene for humanitarian reasons, not for oil. We can prove to the world that we endorse democracy and therefore uh, we've done it under false pretenses in Iraq. We're doing it under legitimate uh, uh, purpose in Syria. It is completely different in Syria. As you mentioned, the Syrians are starving for democracy and they've been, getting, they've been murdered and slaughtered by a thug and a murderous regime. And under the uh, international community's uh, eyes, they're watching, and, you know, with cold blood, he's been slaughtering villages day after day. And we don't see any kind of intervention except condemnation, which is not doing anything to the Syrians. Adrian, give me some examples, just from your own experience, people you know, family, friends, uh, some of the horrors that you, specific, because sometimes you say 70,000, 100,000 people, 200,000 people, that's a number, and people have a hard time relating to a number. So tell us some stories of things that you know to have occurred in Syria with friends or family or colleagues of yours. Mark, I assure you those numbers um, are way more than uh, the UN uh, uh, numbers. Yeah, uh, I think so too. I'm, I'm, I'm positive uh, the unaccounted for, the missing, and the jail are like three, four times that number. So we're talking about three, four hundred thousand people are either dead or in limbo. Give it to us in personal terms, uh, because sometimes people can relate to the story of a child or the story of, of, of a family member more than they can to a number. I, I'm, I'm sorry, but that's just the way, the way it is sometimes. Give us some, some real-life examples of some things that you've seen or you know to have occurred in Syria. Well, I've been active on the Internet and through Facebook. I've been communicating with so many activists inside Syria. Um, I've seen live videos and, uh, you know, the, the, the Assad regime, they've been videotaping those crimes and selling it because they are money hungry and they would do anything for money. They'll tell you that they're acting, uh, they have a mercenary act. So some of those videos, uh, girls at the age of two or three running inside their house with their mom, and the video shows that they've been killed, they've been killed in their own bedrooms. And those thugs, they videotape them while they're laughing 
and with cold blood, they're still in those videos. I've seen it in my both eyes, and I do have it. So this is just a small example from what's happening on the bigger picture. Uh, but, you know, I don't know if you've heard of the massacre that happened two, three days ago. Tell us about it. 800 got slaughtered, and they've been telling people with the speakers, you need to leave your home right now within a half an hour or we're going to uh, slaughter you in your own home. And they've been asking them to bring the deed of their homes with them. And they're, they're, they're confiscating their IDs along with them. It's as if they, they want to do it, you know, illegally. They want to confiscate their property and kick them out. So they're kind of genocide on the um, um, uh, coastline. They want to clear the area. And so much speculation about uh, um, announcing their own state, the Alawite state on the, uh, on the coast of the Mediterranean. It's interesting that you mentioned an Alawite state. Uh, the Alawi, of, of course, for those who don't know, is a, uh, a, actually a, a group of Shia Muslims. They're not all Shia Muslims. It's a, it's a sub-part of, the, of, of Shia Muslims. They're the ones that actually yeah. they control the country. Uh, Bashir Assad is from this Alawi sect, and uh, there may be 14% of the country, about one in seven. And basically, the fear among the Obama administration, and, and, and frankly, England and France and others, is that, ir- that Syria is becoming a sectarian civil war, a war between Shia and Sunni, between Alawi and the majority Sunni, and of course there are also Druze and Christians and so forth. Um, do you fear that, it, that Syria is becoming a religious civil war? Absolutely not, because that's exactly how they want it to look like. They've been, uh, uh, they've been trying to drag uh, so many sects from uh, Lebanon, uh, into that kind of uh, dirty war. But Syria has always been uh, um, a role model in, in, uh, in uh, you know, uh, diversity of uh, religious backgrounds. And we've never had any kind of conflict, religious conflict in between us. But that's how exactly they want it to be happening, because they got the Iranian involvement heavily. And we all know what is the Shia in Iran's uh, uh, agenda in the region. Uh, they keep on dreaming of their empire, uh, Persian empire, and they don't want to lose the Syrian influence in the area because that will affect uh, uh, Hezbollah in the uh, southern part of Lebanon, and they don't want to lose this kind of influence in the region. So for those that don't understand, uh, Iran is a, a Shia state, a Shia Muslim state, and they have been supporting the Assad regime for uh, well, decades, and they also have a group that's been uh, um, it's it's a terrorist group, and it's been it's actually formally denominated a terrorist group by the State Department called Hezbollah, which controls uh, really most all of southern Lebanon. They're the ones who who rain missiles down into Israel, and they also persecute the Sunnis and Christians who live in Lebanon. So there's this unholy alliance, as it were, between Iran, the Assad regime, and Hezbollah, and it's been reported, Adrian, that Hezbollah is actually on the ground fighting. In Syria, they've left Lebanon and they're fighting in Syria. Uh, do you know that to be true? Absolutely, Hassan Nasrallah. He made it clear that he has a complete Nasrallah is the head of Hezbollah. Just for those who, who don't know, Hassan Nasrallah no. is yeah is, is the leader of uh, Hezbollah. Hezbollah. So right, go ahead. Yeah, right. And and Iran just recently announced publicly that they have an interest um, in, in fighting or aborting the Syrian revolution because they don't want to lose that strategic interest with the Assad regime. Of course, Hezbollah is, uh, is, is the main uh, reason. They don't want to lose. Because the Syrian regime, the Assad regime, has always been the transporter uh, for Hezbollah regarding arms, ammunition, and protecting them from any other six in Lebanon as well. Yes, yeah, so and those are some of the munitions, actually, that Israel is now uh, attacking to make sure that they don't go to, to Hezbollah. So let me ask you this, Adrian. We only have about uh, five minutes left. What is it specifically that you would ask the Obama administration and the American people to do? What do you want? You want a no-fly zone? You want weapons? I don't think you want American uh, troops on the ground, do you? Specifically, what do you want from the United States? Absolutely not. Obama has to show the world, the leadership, and he has to maintain his credibility, not put it in jeopardy, because he has made it clear. Using a chemical weapon is a red line. I mean, we don't want the world to say that he's colorblind. Of course, he knows exactly what's going on. A red line is a red line, and it has been crossed. So, so what would you have us do? Uh, what, what would you ask uh, President Obama to do, specifically? We, we, we need to arm the rebels. We need to arm them, and we need to make sure who are the rebels. So we need heavy involvement. We don't need no boots on, on the ground in Syria. Uh, just 
uh, enough logistics in the northern part of Syria bordering Turkey, they can uh, they can help those rebels with all kinds of logistics and minimal uh, uh, armament. That'll do it, and they have. They have a strong belief that they can topple that murderous regime. What, 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 go ahead. I have go a guy ahead. who would like to talk to you, a young kid sure. from Syria. Please, please do. Yes. Hi, how's it going? Hi, what's your name? My name is Mohammed. I'm a freshman at George Mason. Mohammed, welcome. Welcome to the to the Inside Scoop. But uh, tell me, what what uh, are you recently from Syria? Have you been here a while? No, I was born and raised here, but I go to Syria every every summer to visit my family. And what have you seen happening there? Well, what I've been seeing happening there is essentially the Arab Spring. I mean, I don't want to, like, you obviously know all that's there. So right. You spread to it, and then, and you have, so you have pro, basically just protests for simple reforms, they, and these protests were met with, you know, artillery, live ammunition. I mean, in the first couple months alone, a couple thousand people were killed for no reason. And that's when it keeps, and then eventually you have defected soldiers who refuse to kill their own people, you know. I mean, if Obama right now like, orders the National Guard bombard Baltimore. Right? Yeah, exactly, they won't do it. Yeah, they won't do it. They just, they, they defect and they, instead they protect Baltimore from other soldiers who want to kill. That's what they have to say is, essentially. Right, That's and Assad is. is actually using Syrian aircraft to bombard Syrian villages. It's, yeah. it's an amazingly disgusting thing that's happening. Do you support a United States no-fly zone to keep Syrian aircraft from bombing Syrian villages? Oh, 100%. I mean, this is this this man is no longer a leader. He's he's as far as we're concerned, he's an occupying force. He's lost all legitimacy and he has no support among the people. So the fact that he even has these aircraft into aircraft carriers is unconstitutional by, you know, by by human existence and the human nature. Mohammed, let me ask you this uh because I've been calling of course for US intervention for more than a year now. Uh but there are people who who disagree with me and now those same people are saying, you know, it's too late. Uh maybe it should have been done a year ago, but it's too late now. Al-Qaeda has infiltrated the rebel groups. Uh the the good Syrian people, four and a half million are, are refugees. A million outside the country, three and a half million internally displaced. The, the good people have all left, and now it's Al-Qaeda and Assad, and whatever we could have done, it's too late. My question for you, Mohammed, is it too late? There are, there are, no, it's not. There are 20 million Syrians, 4 million leave. That means you have 16 million left, good and, good and well, ready. And, and these are, it's not like, this isn't like Iraq, where you have America invading. You have the Syrian people literally begging for any sort of assistance. And it's, the thing is, it, it, all we've been giving them is food. I mean, what are we going to do, throw, throw spaghetti at the soldiers? <laughs> oh, what are we going to do with that? We need, it's, it's true, it, the, every day we wait makes it harder and harder and that much more disgusting and more of a volatile situa- situation. But it's, if, it's better now than in a year. And it's better, it, it would have been better a year ago too. So every day we wait, we lose more time, more people, and more credibility and trust for the for future alliance. I mean, the Syrian people are going to know, they're going to remember that America didn't help us, help them. They helped Libya, they didn't help us. They're going to remember that. You make a powerful argument, Mohammed. I want to thank you uh, for coming here. I, I, I get goosebumps when I think about what's going on in Syria. And I want to encourage people, if there's still time, to join the protest at the White House right now. Encourage right now. Just drive out to the White House, uh, take, go, take the Metro to McPherson Square, and, and join the attack. And I just want to emphasize, uh, no one, certainly not I, certainly not the, the activists for Free Syria, no one's calling for an American invasion or occupation. This is not Iraq. This is not Afghanistan. I oppose the war. War in Iraq. I oppose the, the continuation of the war in Afghanistan for 10 years. This isn't like a backward country like Afghanistan where the people can hardly read. Syria, uh, Adrian was right, was a role model for coexistence for Christians and, and Sunni and Shia Muslims and Druze all living together in a very secular country. It wasn't even a, a very religious country. Absolutely. And it's, it's falling apart. And uh, really, this is the kind of thing where um, Turkey and Israel and Jordan and all of our allies uh, want us to get involved, Britain and France. And I would like Obama to, to follow through with what he said. And uh, the red lines were crossed. Thank you very much, Mohammed and Adrian, everyone, for, for calling in. Uh, we, this is not the last that I'm going to talk about this. I'm going to keep talking about it until finally there's some relief for the Syrian people. Thank you very much for coming here on the Inside Scoop. Thanks so much. I appreciate that. All right, coming up next is a very different uh, kind of discussion, but uh, one that maybe uh, comes closer to home, but it's certainly very important. And, and that is whether or not we're, we're
we're spending too much time on the internet. Uh, the irony is that the internet brings us some really powerful things, like uh, these people in Syria giving us frontline accounts of the war going on there because they're not allowing ordinary reporters in, uh, and uh, they're giving us tweets and, and YouTube things uh, from there. At the same time, we've got crazy conspiracy theories. We just talked about that in the Raucous Caucus that are also on the internet, and some of us can't seem to get off our Facebook accounts. We sort of stick there all day long and can't get out and enjoy the sunshine. So coming up next is author Henry Senkowitz, who's going to has a new book out called Untangled, to talk about maybe how we should distance ourselves a little bit from the internet and social media. I just want you to stay tuned for that. And also call in if you want to discuss uh, with Henry or with me, 202-889-9797. 202-889-9797. This is Mark Levine. This is We Act Radio. And we'll be right back right after this. Listening to WPWC We Act Radio, 1480 AM, WeActRadio.com. Take Action News with David Schuster, Saturdays from 12 to 3 on We Act Radio, 1480 AM, and WeActRadio.com. Well, for me, it's always been you know, you report the facts, you report like hell, let the chips fall where they may, and the truth ultimately. The truth ultimately is what's going to sort of help our society and help all of us. I don't think progressives want a thumb on the scale on the facts. They just want the facts out there. You let the facts out and progressives will tell you, you know, we're going to win 70% of the time. Uh, you may quibble with the, the percentages or whatnot, but I think that's just sort of what progressives are looking for. And I think that's where this all sort of meshes with, with my interest as a journalist. And my interest, interest as a journalist is report the facts. Here's what's going on. Here's what the facts say. Here's what history says. Here are the lessons we know we have learned. And let people draw their own conclusions. And I think what's so unfortunate right now in the world of broadcast media is I do think that a lot of conservative radio, certainly conservative television, they're not interested in facts. And that's ultimately where I think conservative media is going to have its downfalls, that Americans are hungry. They're just hungry for basic information, hungry for basic facts. You report like hell. You let the chips fall where they may. I think it's it's natural for all of us who care, who are passionate about politics, who feel like we have a sense about the difference between right and wrong. I think it's okay to let that be part of your cover. It's important for all of us as broadcasters and journalists. In this day and age, we have to be authentic. You can't be the person who's up in the ivory tower that comes down and tells people, now you must eat your peas. No, it's all about, we all have personalities, and I think it's being aware sometimes of our own bias, but also being open to the idea that sometimes we're wrong, but we have a dialogue, and we have a passionate dialogue, and we care about this country, we care about this community, and I think that sort of passion is what carries us through. Hear more from David Schuster, Saturdays from 12 to 3 on Take Action News, on We Act Radio, 1480 AM, and WeActRadio.com. You're listening to WPWC, We Act Radio, 1480 AM, weactradio.com. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. Uh, if you haven't heard the news, it's really strange stuff going on in Syria right now. I, you probably know that uh, 70,000 at least have been massacred. That, by the way, that's the minimum number from the United Nations. It dates back to 2011. It's probably well over 100,000, if not over 200,000 innocent people massacred by a vicious dictator, Bashar Assad, who's not just a vicious dictator, but is one supported by our enemies. What's interesting in the past, we've had vicious dictators uh, like Mubarak, uh, or the Shah of Iran or others that we've supported. This is a guy supported by Russia, Iran, the terrorist group Hezbollah. It would seem to be a clear target. I mean, this is a, a guy killing innocent people that uh, helping no U.S. interests. I don't care whether you care for moral reasons or you, kill, you care for American policy reasons. I think we need to do something to help the Syrian people. I recognize that the American people are, are tired of war uh, after Iraq and Afghanistan. I been calling for our troops to come home from there for years now. This is a cause I think is is uh, 
Well, it's worthy. Remember Rwanda? We did nothing in Darfur. We did nothing in Cambodia. We did nothing. This is our chance to be on the right side of history. I I did promise you author Henry Sinkowitz on Untangled. We will get to him, I promise, in about 15 minutes. But I do want to get one last guest on uh, who actually uh, saw, uh, I believe, um, uh, he's going by the name Ronnie. We're not going to use his real name because I don't want him to get in trouble with the regime. But Ronnie, your family is still in Syria right now, right? Yes. Uh, tell me what happened to your family in Syria. Uh, my father-in-law, who's um, 88 years old, um, two years ago was in front of um, my sister-in-law's house, and he was kidnapped from there. And um, we kept asking everybody, what is he? He just disappeared. 88-year-old uh, man disappeared. Yeah, he's because he opposed the regime, and uh, they felt he may because. We are uh, from the minority in Syria, and they felt he may be a threat because they want to try to portray the the war there as between uh, you know Sunni and and other people. Now this but is interesting. So you're from the Alawi m- minority? Um, no, we're from a, the Druze minority. The Druze minority. Okay, but uh, but the Druze are not Sunni, and what you're showing is that uh, it's not just a Sunni Muslim cause; it's a cause for for all the Syrian people. Yes, yes it but, is. But here's yes. what I find interesting: your 88 year old father-in-law surely was not able enough to pick up arms and to attack the Syrian regime. Clearly, he posed no physical threat to the regime. To be honest with you, they, they don't care. These people, will, they, they have killed children who are 12 and 14-year-old kids just to punish their parents. These people have, uh, you know, uh, they, they don't have any mercy. They, they, you know, they feel that this is the way you, you teach people a lesson by, by massacring the whole family. You know, it, it just the last two, three days in a town, on the west coast of Syria, you know, the whole villages have been, uh, you know, massacred. We don't have exact numbers because nobody could verify, you know, what's left, what's not. Everybody who's, who's alive running away from their town. And, uh, and the problem is, uh, you know, um, we don't see an end, you know. Uh, the right. regime is, like you said, supported by Hezbollah and by uh, Iran. And they're giving them a lot of manpower, a lot of money and weapons. And, uh, and of course, you point out you're not on CNN. The reason you're not on CNN, that's not really CNN's fault. I mean, they could risk their lives to go in there, but the Assad regime does not allow any reporters in there. So uh, when there's the war in Libya, people could see pictures. Uh, it's in, in Syria, you have to smuggle them out on the internet. And yes, they kill them. I've, there's few reporters who were killed by that's the Syrian right. regime. If they know that you're a reporter, they, they target you. That's exactly right. Uh, reporters, Western reporters, as well as uh, uh, Syrian reporters, have been killed by yeah. the regime. Well, Ronnie, I wish you uh, uh, good good uh, good wishes. I uh, certainly strongly support the United States doing something to help the Syrian people. I, I personally, I support a no-fly zone because the idea of I just imagine, uh, and even I think hands. To be honest, to, to just even the handle it. So because we really we don't want to procre- you know procrastinate this war because the longer it goes the more it's going to become a bigger problem. I, I think you're right. Mohammed brought up an interesting point. He said, what would happen if, if uh, the National Guard or the Air Force were to bomb Baltimore? If, if our own American... It, it, it's unthinkable. You just say no, these words. It's unthinkable that American military would attack American cities. You can, might imagine some renegade soldier, some crazy mentally ill, one or two people doing something like that. But the idea that a, a, a leader would order the military to massacre the people it's 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 unthinkable in america yeah. and and my guess is it i mean even though there was a horrible dictatorship in syria for for decades that in syria people never thought this would ever get this far exactly we we never thought our own army would attack us we you know so uh listen i, I support your cause i will continue to Thank be out there much. supporting and, your cause uh, I, anybody who's listening to you could support us by calling their congressmen, and, you know, they'll be really great. So. Yeah, this is called We Act Radio, so go ahead and act. The Capitol switchboard, by the way, uh, and it's there's, it's Sunday, so you'll probably just have to leave a message, but you could definitely call okay. next week. 202-225-3121 will get you to any member of Congress. Urge them. Again, no one's asking for an invasion of Syria. The Syrians don't want it. I don't want it. Americans don't want it. But simply a no-fly zone to stop the Syrian aircraft from massacring its own people. Let's remember Rwanda. Let's remember Darfur. Let's remember Cambodia. Cambodia. 
I believe we have a, a obligation as the most powerful nation on earth to stop mass murder when we can. And, and not just because it's the right thing to do, that's the main reason, but also because people will remember and they'll remember whose side we were on. Were we on the right side of history or do we stand by while others were massacred? Thank you, Ronnie, for coming here on the Inside Scoop. I thank appreciate you. your time. Thank you, Mark, very much. And thank you to all your listeners. If you want to join in the protest, it's occurring right now at the White House. Uh, all you have to do is go down and join the protest right now at the White House uh, and, and help the people. It's interesting about this issue, and uh, w- w- we could take some calls about it uh, later on at 202-889-9797, is it's not your typical liberal conservative issue. It's really an isolationist versus internationalist issue. And there are liberals, no question, people on the left. I've, I've had some of you call into my show who actively believe we should not get involved in Syria. Uh, I, I would argue you're an isolationist. Uh, and then the conservatives are split, too. There are conservatives that want to intervene and conservatives that don't. So there are people on both sides of this. Uh, and it's something that, uh, that will always be up for debate. Um, let's see who we've got on the line here. Oh, uh, welcome to the Inside Scoop. Who's this? Hello, Mark. Yes, you're on the air. Uh, okay, great. I have um, a very important woman in uh, part of the Syrian revolution. Her name is very well known. Her name is uh, Farah al Atasi. Okay. And she is going to um, uh, uh, talk about what's going on. She's originally from Homs. Oh, and, Homs, uh, of course, is one of the cities that was, has been almost destroyed. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, She's talking right now in Arabic uh, to the group. Okay, are you going to translate for us? From the Nazi is Bashar al-Assad. She's talking in English anyway. We have a message to President Obama. We would like all our fellow American citizens to hear this message loud and clear. Today, there is a Holocaust in Syria. Listening to a live protest uh, that's occurring right now at the White House uh, from the Syrians, uh, f- uh, f- the activists for a free Syria. Uh, obviously, the passions are high, and the question is whether President Obama will keep his word. Uh, he said that if the Syrian regime used chemical weapons, that uh, that would be a red line, that would be a game changer, that would cause the United States to come in and help the Syrian people. The evidence is now overwhelming. Even the United States uh, has admitted that they've used them. Now they're saying they use them in small quantities. The red line appears to be changing, and the question is whether President Obama will help the Syrian people. Yes. Yes. So um, you heard uh, Mr. Atashi is, is very, very uh, uh, well 
outspoken and she's been all over the world uh, representing the Syrian women and the Syrian people in the United States. And we, we played her right here on the Inside Scoop, and I want to thank you for calling back and for doing that. Uh, oh, th- th- sure, this sure, will not be sure. the, the end, uh, I guarantee you. I will promise I will keep on this topic uh, until and unless there's this peace in Syria. So thank you very thank much. Thank you so much for all your support, for all the people who are supporting us, including the Israeli people. Thank you so much, and may God bless. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you, and thank you very much for, for calling in. Thank you. Take care. Mm-hmm. Bye-bye. All right. Well, you know, it's 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 a very it's an emotional issue, and uh, I don't blame them. Their country is being ripped apart. Uh, this was a peaceful country, and it was one where, yeah, there was a dictator in charge, and the people simply wanted, as part of the Arab Spring, to have equal rights, to not live under a police state where everything they say is being watched and monitored, where there's a secret police. Uh, and Syria is a very modern country. This isn't like uh, Afghanistan, where most people are illiterate. Uh, these are literate people. Damascus is, I think, the oldest capital city on earth. It's been around for 5,000 years. And sadly, a lot of the wonderful treasures, archaeological treasures, crusader castles and ancient palaces are being destroyed in this war. But most importantly, of course, is the human cost. Hundreds of thousands of innocent men, women, and children dead. Uh, millions are being exiled. And a once prospering populous country is being um, well decimated. There is some good stuff, though, that I think can come out of this. And the irony is that uh, they say, uh, uh, I, I, um, uh, I'm messing up the, the slogan, but hard times make for interesting bedfellers. I'm, I'm sure I'm ruining the, the cliche. But the point is that sometimes enemies can become friends in, in the worst of times. And in this case, ironically, Syria and Israel, countries that have been at war for 60 years, are joining together against the Assad regime. Again, also with Turkey and Jordan. These are moderate Arab Muslim countries joining with Israel, all in the fight to help the Syrian people. To me, if this is not a cause we can support, I'm not sure (laughs) what one is. This isn't about oil. It's simply about human rights and justice. So I want to thank all my callers for calling in. I'm going to take a quick break. When I come back, I I do have a change of pace. Uh, Henry Sekowitz is the author of Untangled. And, you know, many of us uh, sit around and we uh, spend all our days on Facebook and tweeting and uh, looking up the Internet. And sometimes I I think um, I was just on the Internet yesterday and uh, someone said to me, oh, it's a beautiful day outside. And I'd hardly noticed. So uh, maybe I need uh, to see a psychiatrist or maybe I just need to read Henry's book, Untangled, and find out how I can actually leave the Internet and go out and enjoy the sun. It's harder sometimes than you think. Uh, We'll be right back with him and also with your calls. If you want to talk about the Internet and social media and whether or not you ever want to get untangled, give us a call at 202-889-9797. This is Mark Levine. This is the Inside Scoop. We'll be right back right after this. You're listening to WPWC We Act Radio, 1480 AM, weactradio.com. Friends, David Schuster here, and all of us at WEAC Radio are so proud of our neighbors here in Southeast D.C., especially one of our partners, The Ark. The Ark is at 1901 Mississippi Avenue Southeast. It's the home to some of Washington's best, including the Washington Ballet, the Levine School of Music, Boys and Girls Club, and the Children's Health Project all provide a number of programs and services within the very same facility. The Ark is also home to the Ark Theater, the only theater east of the river, which hosts a variety of dance, music, and theatrical shows each year. Almost everything you could want is at the Ark, so stop by and see them. The Ark, 1901 Mississippi Avenue in Southeast. For more information, visit the Ark's website, www.thearkdc.org, or call 202-889-5901. The Ark, part of Southeast D.C. You're listening to WPWC We Act Radio, 1480 AM, weactradio.com. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. So uh, we're going to get away from uh, the horrors of Syria and talk about something that's... uh, uh, well, 
awful in its own way, but definitely not uh, definitely not on the scale of what's going on in Syria. But uh, you know, when we talk about things that go on in America, uh, some some of it is that we're wrapped too much into. Uh, the things that are going on the internet, and author Henry Sinkowitz has a new book out called Untangled, uh, and he's going to tell us how to get away from some of these things. So, Henry, welcome to the Inside Scoop. Hey, Mark. Thanks for le- letting me have a chance to ta- talk with you and your listeners. Um, it's really a pleasure to hear you, and although I have to say I'm, I've been absolutely overwhelmed with emotion from the last few segments. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a powerful thing, and I, you know, I, I try to deal with all kinds of topics. Uh, it's, 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 it's kind of a sharp difference from, from, from Syria on to, uh, uh, to, to social media, but uh, social media is something that Americans, uh, most of us are faced with every day, I guess. I, I don't know about you, but I have a, about 100 emails in my box, and most of them appear to be from Facebook, I'm not sure, or, yeah. or tweeting. Yeah, I I wish, uh, in my daily life, I'm, I live very much in the technology space, and I wish 100 emails would, is, is sort of at the low volume of that. <laughs> and then I've got a whole Twitter set of followers just because of all the technology stuff I've done over the years. And so, I mean, I've got like over 40,000 Twitter followers just who are sort of watching me, which just kind of overwhelms me on so many levels. That's amazing. Well, yeah, I hope you tweeted out today's radio show uh, so people have, can listen in. Oh, yeah. It's, it's all so, out so there. So tell, tell us, uh, for those of my, my audience that don't know who you are, who you are when you say you're in the technology space. What does yeah. that even um, mean? Well, actually, I, I do a whole bunch of things. I, I'm very much inside this, the inside cyberspace and the cybersecurity world, and then as well as being considered one of the fathers of cloud computing. I mean, most notably, this year I was named Computer World Premier 100, so the 100 top technologists in their mind for this year. It's, I feel a little old when they did that. Um, it, it's a lifetime achievement. That's award. very impressive. So when my yeah. when my computer goes down, I just go to you, basically. You, you, can, you, could, you could do that. I mean, I, I could probably help you out a whole bunch. But that, that's, that's like going to president when you've got a, 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 um, so you got a, a pothole in, in, your, in your sidewalk and you call, President Obama, fix my pothole. Well, uh, Henry Mark, will fix Mark, my computer. Mark, um, I don't know if you've ever, my, my mother, I mean, she will do that to me on a regular basis. <laughs> there you go. Although she, she brought up something that you just brought up um, right before you went um, on into the next segment. And that was um, yesterday you were talking to friends and they were saying, what a beautiful day. Right. And we were down in Florida for the, holi- uh, for the holidays in December. And there we all were just kind of living in our little uh, electronic media world. And my mother, who, who, who's in her early 80s, um, made the comment and uh, who, she said, I just want you all to talk to me. You're all here. Uh, you're all down in Florida. The weather is beautiful. You just need to talk to me. Um, and it was very precedent. I mean, it's it's very much what I was writing about in the book. And I mean, and, and Untangled is dealing with this whole notion of this overwhelming volume, velocity, and variety of entanglements in your life. I mean, is it social media driven? Yeah. Is it Twitter driven? Yeah. Is it just all these other things that are just um, bombarding It's also your us? mother calling you all the time saying, why haven't you called me like you should? Why aren't you a good son? I actually, I, I don't That's have that. That's an entanglement too? You it, it is, it, that is an entanglement. Relationships are an entanglement. <laughs> your career is an entanglement. Sure. All of this stuff or your entanglements and it's how you're dealing with all this stuff that is just grabbing on to you and as I characterize in the book all these little things these little vines that are catching you on this journey as you're you're traveling down the path that you're living so so, so now this is uh, your second book your third book uh, this, I, I lose count how many books you've done <laughs> this is my second book um, uh, okay. first book came out in 2006 and it was called Centerlined and it dealt with trying to find organizational interpersonal balance um, and looking at that from a dynamics perspective. Um, and then that sounds like a lot of good jargon and gobbledygook uh, to me. Do you know what? As a radio host, I mean, some, some kind of double think perspective. Oh. I, well, well, come on, help it, me out here. Well, it, it, it was s- sitting down and trying to figure out how do you find balance in your life. And this is actually very much a follow on to that, but looking at a, a little bit more of a nuance. And what I tried to do here, um, and I don't think I achieved as well in the first one, was to try to make this much more approachable. I mean, their in, initial reviews are coming in, and it's been. I've been again. I've been a little overwhelmed. Don't you just go up to the mountaintop and speak to the Zen master yeah. and then uh, and meditate? Isn't that the way yeah. out? Yeah. Do you know what? Actually, that's I, I actually that's one of those things I rail against in the book. Oh, okay. Is that is that um, Saint Augustine really wrote about three ways of life? I mean, an active way, a contemplative way, and what he characterized as that third way, an, an active contemplation. And I would say that 
we all want to have that ladder. I mean, that very last one. We don't necessarily want to be completely active, completely extroverted, maybe to use today's uh, jargon. But see, I can't meditate because I can't do the lotus position. Oh, My knees don't fit that way, and so you know, I don't. Yeah. I, 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 you you can find meditation in, in in this in any space in your life. I mean, I was chat. I was at a Kentucky Derby party last night and talking to a few friends, and one of the topic the, the book came up because um, it's it's just kind of hitting me in my life right now. And we were talking about all these other places you can find peace. Um, and I would say that in, in this notion of c contemplation, you have to embrace silence, stillness, and solitude. I mean, I, you, you just have to find places to carve that out. Um, I will tell you that one of the best places for me in my life is that 14-hour-plus um, trip in the car by myself down to Florida once or twice a year. Hmm. I mean, it's a completely yeah. disconnected. Turn the Only radio off. Only if there's off. no traffic and and uh, uh, the the radio is is actually getting the right tunes uh, to. Uh, I, and and then what happens to me is I always get speeding tickets because I'm in that zone. I'm happy. Yeah. I'm contemplative, and I'm going 75 miles an hour. Um, and it, it depends on on the on, <laughs> on, the on, on, on on the drive, and it depends a lot on where where you're um what you're listening to. Um, I that's but, true. It, it is the music. If I listen to slow tunes, I'm I'm not going to go um, that fast. Well, slow tunes um in in a traffic jam may not actually be the best thing um yeah so. well, suicidal tunes perhaps yeah. but, but i find up and everyone has their own yeah. thing i find personally that when i need to contemplate when i need some relaxation i tend to go to nature i, I go to the potomac river i go to the mountains mm -hmm. uh that nature somehow does it for me in a way that somehow sitting at home in front of my computer does not well i think you're absolutely correct i use the backdrop um the the, the narrative arc inside the book is a, a, a hike i took with a boy scout troop i was running um, a few decades ago in Taiwan, and it was a cross-island hike. They have Boy Scouts in Taiwan? They do, actually. They have American Boy Scouts in Taiwan. I did uh, not know that. Mm -hmm. See how much they, you learn here they, on they, React Radio? Uh, they, in fact, I think they still have three troops to the last time I checked. Um, three troops? Three three different troops. That's three boys. No, no, no. It's, it's, three more, it's, a little, it's a few more than that. I mean, all right. they're, all, they're all Americans. All right, um, so you're in Taiwan, um, and, and, and you're and in the forest of Taiwan? I, right. I, I don't know. We're what. right in the middle of the island, and so we were going through Aboriginal homeland. Okay. Um, so, in, in, again, early 80s, um, these, were pe these were people who, um, in many cases, Japanese was their first language because of the Jap Japanese occupation of Taiwan um, from the late 1890s uh, mm -hmm. until the end of World War II. Um, but it was just an amazing time to completely and totally disconnect and actually take the time to help these young men learn a little bit about themselves and about the world around them. Um, and I just use that as the framework because I think you're absolutely right, Mark. Um, moving yourself and re distancing yourself, active, doing this active distancing from all of this electronic, always-on world we're living in um, is absolutely essential. You, yeah, you, but Henry, you know, if I'm away from my phone or my computer for two hours, people keep trying to find me. Right. I hear beeps and buzzes and tweets, yeah. and I hear vi vibrations, and then the phone rings. Um, help! I, I, I can't escape them. Well, but you're, you need to escape, because you need to escape to find yourself. Um, I, I mean, and at times, we all get addicted to it. We, I mean, it's, it, there's something, that, that adrenaline surge, that little bit of, that little shot of dopamine that happens as all of a sudden ding, the ding, ding. Wait, yeah. hold on, I gotta um, get my phone yeah, here. I, uh, I mean, a, the old AOL thing, you've got mail, just uh, <laughs> could be one of the biggest charges in your life. I mean, unfortunately, now 60%. That was pre spam days. Yeah, and, I mean, that was when getting mail was exciting. Right, I mean, as opposed to the 60, 80 percent of the of the internet traffic being spammed today. right right exactly I mean, but i i got viagra uh you know proposed uh, to me and, um, and, and the, a nigerian prince really wants to talk to well, me well i i think i could have made a lot of money over the years by all of these investments that have come my way but i <laughs> but the problem was that um that, i mean they like so many other things were just false and, and misleading so, so. this book it, it, it's a fictional account uh, based on reality uh, no it's, it's actually a narrative um so it, it really it, it, it starts in three phases it, it talks about the notion of entanglement um, and, and how we are sort of overwhelmed by all of this stuff. Um, uh, I mean, the career, the relationships, the physical, the spiritual things. And I, I, Okay, you've convinced me. Yeah. I think everyone's entangled. Yeah. What, what, so, so, um, that, so then move on. What, then, what do we then, do about then it? Then I pull, pull it back a little bit, and then I, I say, I mean, I talk about the concept. I mean, how do you embrace silence, solitude, and stillness? And then as, as some of the big pillars of, of untangling yourself in, through active contemplation. Um, and then putting it inside the framework of, the, of a conceptual, a continuous um, nature of, of going and looking at contemplation in your life. And now I end it. I mean, the last half, actually, of the book has a few concrete steps. And I don't say, here is your 12-step program to untangling. I, I can't do that. I mean, if, if you want me to do that, 
Um, wrong writer. Uh, no, no, but here's I, um, the thing. Look, I, I'm, I'm a talk radio host, mm-hmm. which means I'm a loudmouth. I talk a lot. Uh, in radio, silence is death. Yeah. It's yeah. Actually, in fact, mm-hmm. they, there's actually, uh, like, when people say radio silence, they mean ultimate death. The worst thing you can have on this, on this microphone yeah. is no sound. Yeah. So in this ADHD, attention <laughs> uh, deficit, high deficit, this, I don't even know what the thing means. Hi, hyper... Hyperactivity disorder. Yeah. Thank you very much, there. That was Jeffrey uh, helping helping out. Uh, in this, where we we, we yeah. need we need we need stimulation every single moment. We can't stop. We can't stop. Um, how could someone like me or someone like many of the people who are listening to us right now? I mean, you can't turn off your phone and your TV, can you? Well, yes, yes, you can. No, they don't have off switches. No, they, they do have off switches, and sometimes you actually need to take those off switches um, because you know what? I mean, you you have to make a choice. I mean, you can either be completely in, entangled like that, and then you get to end up being entertained by life, or you can find that distance and end up being uh, being able to give yourself that emotional cleansing, cleaning out that system to, to figure out how you actually engage in it. Do you ever watch The Office, the TV show? I do. Okay, one of my favorite episodes of The Office is they've got Ryan. I don't know if everyone who knows the characters of The Office, but Ryan's like the intern. He's he's one of the younger people in The Office, and of course, he's into technology. And he's he's bringing his, his iPhone, uh, as we would, as I would, to a bar. They're doing a trivia game. Uh, they're playing the trivia game, and the guy says to Ryan, sorry, you, you know, you can't use your phone in the trivia game, because you can look up the question in Google. Uh, yeah. Please give me your phone. And Ryan is like reaching out like, no, no, don't take my phone. Anyway, they take his phone away and Ryan goes on about, oh, 20 more seconds in the trivia game. He's like, no, I can't do it. And he runs back, gets his phone and leaves the game. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it, we are tethered to this world, this, this, this uh, cyber world. So what's the benefits of letting go? Well, I think there are a lot of benefits, although I will say that I'm fortunate at times. I live in a classified world as well. And so when we walk into some of these other facilities, we actually have to hand over all of our devices. Oh, wow. Um, so those devices don't get to come into us. So do you know what? Then we actually have to sit into a meeting and pay attention. Uh, what's uh, that? Um, yeah. Well, um, yeah, speaking of paying attention, I got a phone got a call, call right call. now. So let's see if, if someone actually wants to join in this conversation. Uh, you're on the air. Welcome to We Act Radio. Who's this? Hey, Mark, it's Michael, SW, from Bronx, New York City. Michael from the Bronx. Do you have a comment uh, to our guest, Henry, about the entanglement of uh, the Internet? Actually, I do. And as much as I um, find your guest your guest to be quite informative, I'm in slight disagreement with him. Okay. And, and the reason being is that at this day and age, when you do a comparison of all the fact findings, especially when we're being briefed with news, um, you look at the television and you see stuff that's reported, but then when you're on the Internet, on Facebook, you see things that have not been reported. And I think that is how we are becoming more informed and more oh. that, that's a good. More that's a good point, yeah. Michael. Let me let me raise it to Henry. So Henry, yeah. M- Michael yeah. makes the point. It's actually the point I made with the, actually the oh. Syrian guests. There's information you get from the internet that's not being shown in your mainstream uh, news sources. Right. No, no, and I, I actually for the guests, I absolutely agree. I mean, I, I remember many years ago um, getting a, a magazine that did monthly press clippings of the world press. Um, just because I wanted to get a different perspective. Um, I was for, I've been fortunate. I've lived overseas a whole bunch of my life. And, I mean, it's always great to hear these other media sources. I used to curl up in college with the shortwave radio to just go and get other media so that you could get these other perspectives. So you're not saying no. turn off no. the Internet. You're just no, saying no. turn it off for a few hours a day. Right, or, or find a way so that you're not always just inside that digital envelope so that you're able to go there and be able to detox yourself. I mean, it's, it's very much like when you go and you go on a fast of some sort. Um, I mean, and not a purge, a fast. Um, and or you you take you take caffeine out of your life. I mean, all of a sudden you get a different clarity and you get a different sense of direction. The question here is, how do you find a little bit of distance to be able to pull some of these other influences out of your life and then get to get to repack your bags? I mean, so, so, Michael, I think what he's saying he's not he's not saying turn it off entirely, no. unplug it, mm-hmm. throw away your computer. I mean, this is a technology guy after all. Yeah. Who's, who's talking to Go us? On. He's just yeah. saying for what an hour a day, two hours a day, um, whatever you believe is necessary. Again, because at times you, you need. To, you need to clean out a little bit, uh, a little bit more at the beginning, and then you just need to find a, those periods where you can go there and end up. Th- 
thinking for yourself because if, uh, Michael I mean at times what ends up happening is that's all and Mark this is not to be your, Go I, know, ahead. I know your job Go, bring it on uh, I can take is it is that at times we, we listen to the radio we listen to the TV and but at times we need to be able to stop and think for ourselves and I think that's actually what you challenge your listeners to do is to stop and think for themselves absolutely and, and I, I, exactly I strongly agree what? that when you're not listening to my show you should turn off the radio so that's I'm fine with that go, go ahead Michael, uh, go, Michael. <laughs> that's, that's exactly where I was going with yeah. that because the thing is that when we see um, stuff on Facebook and we're not seeing on the mainstream media I for one feel that I'm not going to keep it to myself I'm connect with so many friends you want to spread the word and make sure everyone knows the truth for the sake of not just only yourself but your fellow Americans yeah. and you don't want to get screwed by the people who's committing the injustice. Oh no, you I, know, I would have completely agree with power. that. Yeah, I mean, and, and sharing these and having and having the ability ability to have these friends that you can trust to share these questions and these comments and what you're thinking about. I think is as I drive go through the book. I mean, I talk a great deal about finding that distance, and I ended up I ended up with how do you allow yourself to awaken beauty in your life. I mean, it's that notion of, yeah. I mean, we, we get overwhelmed, and I mean, I, I go on and on about the difference between glamour and beauty, so that we, we, we don't have, the, like, these little cotton candy ideas. Um, right. We actually don't have some me meaningful wrong, ideas. Yeah, but don't get me wrong, though. I definitely understand what you're saying. In fact, it's a beautiful day outside here in New York City. I'm getting ready to go out and enjoy well, it. Well, go, go out and enjoy the day as soon as the show's over. Or you know what you could do? You can actually listen on your iPhone to my show as you're going out and enjoying the day. So, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm actually going totally against Henry's thesis here. But but thank you for your call, Michael. I always appreciate it when you call in. Always. Always. Good day, gentlemen. Uh, thank, thank you, Michael. Yeah, see, uh, so I, I just totally ruined your whole thesis because I said no. listen to my show while, but you can. I mean, you can listen. Go to marklevingtalk.com. You can listen on your iPhone, and you can you can actually do two things at once. You can. You can, but know. but no, that's okay. That's all right. You, I'm, I'm, I'm basically plugging my show, but what you're saying is that you should actually turn everything off at some point during the day yeah, just for your mental... Yeah, you, you, you actually, it's more than just turning things off because it's, it's, I mean, because that's the silence. I mean, there's also um, finding a place to quiet down, um, and that's that notion of stillness. So that wait, wait. Silence and stillness are different things. They are. They What's are, the difference between um, silence and stillness? And well, and solitude. And um, solitude. And solitude. So that you. This are sounds actually, like confinement. I don't uh, know about it's this. It's not confinement. It's it, well, if 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 you find being with yourself and just by yourself confining. It is confined. I right? guess so. Well, I guess it depends if you're in some small dark room with uh, the doors locked or not. Well, but one, one would hope not. One is actually hoping that you're outside enjoying the beautiful the, the be nature, beautiful nature so around you. What is it? I, I got what solitude is. That's okay. being alone. What's the difference between silence and stillness? Um, silence is actually not having a lot of that audio m bombardment around you so that you're able to remove yourself and all of those types of entanglements. And then stillness is actually sitting down and not fidgeting and not going there and just always being in motion. You can be quietly in motion, but you, at times you just need to stop. And if, for those who are watching the webcast, I'm moving my hands back and forth in this whole notion of anti-stillness. Um, but I mean, uh, because each... But working out is good for me. I need the exercise. Right, and that, that is part of it. But that's not necessary. I mean, but meditation is also good for you. Um, although at times I think, I mean, I also contend that, I mean... Contemplation is a little bit different than prayer or meditation. I mean, meditation at times is looking inward. Um, co um, contemplation is looking around you. And then prayer is, is this whole notion of looking to some other higher being. So, I mean, I, I try to find, again, um, walking a very thin line from that St. Augustine laid out, I mean, uh, that, that line. So, again, the name of your book is Untangled. Yep. I assume they can find it at Amazon. Um, and Amazon, Barnes & Nobles, any of the major online uh, outlets. You can buy it from the website, www.untangledthebook.com. Um, it's available on Kindle. It's available on Nook. Um, first... And, so, yeah. and I'll, I'll put a link to it on my website yeah. uh, when we're done with this broadcast at marklivingtalk.com. Henry Senkowitz, thank you for coming oh, into the studio oh. and then sharing uh, your wisdom with us. Oh, great. Thanks for seeing you, Mark. I appreciate it so much. When we come back, I have some thoughts on Jason Collins. I want to talk about the first uh, male uh, pro basketball star, actually the first uh, of any of the major of any of the major sports to come out of the closet. And I've got some thoughts on that. If you want to call in, it's 202-889-9797. We'll be right back with more of the Inside Scoop right after this.
You're listening to WPWC We Act Radio, 1480 AM, weactradio.com. Hello, my name is Jim Gray, and I am a judge of the Superior Court in California and a former federal prosecutor in Los Angeles. I would like to talk to you for a moment about marijuana. Did you know that since the federal government first banned marijuana in 1937, usage in this country has actually gone up by about 4,000 percent? Or did you know that in the Netherlands, where adults are allowed to possess small amounts of marijuana and buy it from government-regulated businesses, fewer adults and fewer teenagers smoke marijuana than here in our country? Or that an American is arrested on marijuana charges every 38 seconds? If you are wondering if any of this makes sense, you are not alone. To find out more, contact the Marijuana Policy Project at 1-877-JOIN-MPP or visit them on the web at mpp.org. Thank you and good luck to us all. Hello, this is Julia Louis-Dreyfus and I want to tell you about my new favorite discovery, Yosemite National Park. I recently went there with my husband and children and we walked the trails to see the breathtaking waterfalls, admired the grand meadows and giant sequoias. But the future of our national parks is uncertain. Many challenges face our parks today, from polluted air and water to development threats outside their borders and inadequate funding to protect our national heritage. That's why the National Parks Conservation Association recently completed a decade-long assessment of the challenges facing our national parks, along with proposed actions that will ensure our children and grandchildren will be able to enjoy the parks as we have. Our national parks have inspired Americans for nearly 100 years. As we approach the centennial of the National Park Service in 2016, please join us in helping to protect our national park legacy. Find out how at www.mpca.org. You're listening to WPWC We Act Radio, 1480 AM, weactradio.com. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. This is Mark Levine. So I've had three very different topics today. Uh, everything from the situation in Syria to getting unentangled from the Internet to something that, um, well, I, I think is, is quite important. It, 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 I'm talking about Jason Collins coming out as gay. He is, of course, the first male athlete in a major U.S. sport. Of course, major is all we can always argue about it, but the, most people talk about American sports. They talk about the big four, right? It's, it's basketball, baseball, football, of course, and uh, hockey. Some people even leave out hockey. But, uh, of course, uh, Jason Collins coming out was big news. Now, uh, it's amazing to me how many people have already been attacking this guy. Uh, they don't attack him so much for being gay. Uh, they attack him, I think, for trying to uh, get some kind of uh, publicity out of this as if there's something wrong with that. Um, I had on the air, on the Inside Scoop TV show, uh, a Republican strategist who was basically saying, you know, this guy is just trying to, to, to increase, to make his career go, and, uh, you know, he's, he's not the, 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 the best athlete in his, his uh, division, you know, in, in, in uh, you know, scoring and so forth and i i just thought that was kind of well kind of churlish to use an old-fashioned word kind of kind of mean kind of unfair uh i think it's you got to be pretty good to be in the nba to begin with thank you very much uh jason collins has been on six different teams he's largely a defensive player he's a big guy he's seven feet tall uh, and he is known for being a, a heavy, hard-hitting defensive player. In fact, I think that breaks a lot of the stereotypes of uh, a gay person uh, to be to be someone who's that that fighting and that defensive and that that strong physically as well as mentally. But I think that it's also unfair because he is the first, and I think more will come, and someone has to be the first. And frankly, I'm disappointed that we still need to have these kinds of firsts in America. And I look forward to the day when 
will have the last of the firsts, right? I mean, it just seems like for the last few decades, uh, ever since, I guess, Jackie Robinson integrated uh, in baseball, uh, you know, first black man, first woman on the Supreme Court, first black president, African-American president, uh, and now uh, the first uh, person to come out as gay on, uh, on, uh, on the sports team. But he won't be the last. There'll be the first football player. There will be the first hockey player. There will be the first baseball player. And then one day there will be no more firsts. One day, every aspect of America will be open to everyone. Male, female, black, white, gay, straight, transgender, uh, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, atheist, poor, rich, every segment of society. And to me, that's what America is all about. To me, that's what makes America strong. It is our diversity. It is uh, the variance uh, amongst us that makes us such a strong nation. I mean, every other nation on earth has uh, one ethnicity, maybe two, maybe three. We are the country of everyone. And that means everyone, regardless of race, regardless of gender, and definitely regardless of sexual orientation. So for all those people, like my Republican guest, who say, ah, it's no big deal what Jason Collins did. I say, if it's no big deal, how come no one did it before? If it's no big deal, why is the first male athlete to make this announcement in 2013? If it's no big deal, ask yourself this. All the gay athletes who've ever come out of the closet in baseball, football, basketball, and hockey, every one of them is at least seven feet tall. <laughs> and that'll tell you how rare it is and how brave it is for Jason Collins to come out. You know, he followed in a long footsteps uh, of people before. And yes, I, you know, you don't have to compare bravery, but certainly even more brave was someone like Martina Navratilova. That, that's bravery. Or Jackie Robinson, for that matter. That's bravery. I mean, there were Dodgers who said that they were not going to play on a team with a black man. And yet, uh, what he did has made a black person on a sports team to be not only un, uninteresting and extremely common, it's, it's probably the majority. So how do we get there? Well, I think people like Martina Navratilova showed us the way. Think about what she did. This is back in the early 80s. I think the only person to come out of the closet in, that was an athlete before her was Billie Jean King, and she was outed. She was outed against her will in the early 70s. But Martina Navratilova was an immigrant from Czechoslovakia. She was a woman from then-communist Czechoslovakia, behind the Iron Curtain, looking to have freedom in America. And nine days before she's to become an American citizen, and in that day, being gay could very well affect your chances of becoming an American citizen. Nine days before her hearing, she was not outed. She was not forced out. She told the truth about herself at a time when the Women's Tennis Association was against her coming out, told her not to come out. And yet she did. She told simple truth that she's lesbian. And in doing so, she lost endorsements. She lost a lot of money. She lost millions and millions of dollars. But she told the truth. And then she went on to be the single winningest tennis champion in world history. I forget that she win 86 to 1 or 90 to 3, whatever it was. She won uh, well, well greater than 90%, probably closer to 98 or 99% of all her matches. She's a very good tennis player. But she also is someone with a lot of class. And when Jason Collins came out, she wrote a beautiful piece that didn't even mention the things that she had done. She played down her accomplishments. She said, well, I... I was in an individual sport, which is true. She was an individual sport. I, you know, I'm a woman. It is easier, no doubt, for a woman to come out of the closet as an athlete than a man. You know, when women NBA players come out uh, as lesbian, people don't think much of it, I guess, because sports is seen as a masculine endeavor. And then comes Jason Collins. Uh, Jason Collins, who secretly wore on his uniform the number 98 in honor of Matthew Shepard the young gay man who was literally crucified 
on a rail fence in Wyoming and left to die in 1998. Now, 1998 was only 15 years ago. And I want to reflect on how far we've come since the days of Matthew Shepard. In 1998, it was not that hard for two young men to take a third young man and uh, well, crucify him for being gay. But there's something really meaningful, I think, about a seven-foot-tall black basketball player wearing a jersey to remember a five foot two inch young white guy in Wyoming who's crucified on a fence it shows to me that being gay is in all cultures in all peoples doesn't matter whether you're tall or short or black or white or young or old doesn't matter whether you're in Wyoming or in Washington DC when you think about it culturally Matthew Shepard and Jason Collins could not be more different from each other. And yet what, what a gesture for Jason Collins to remember Matthew Shepard in this way. In fact, uh, Matthew Shepard's parents were quite moved by, by Jason's gestures. And I'm sorry for all the people that say, well, you know what, he wasn't that good a player anyway. There's all kinds of players in the NBA. I have no doubt we're going to see some stars come out eventually. But the irony is that the stars are the ones that are getting the big endorsements. They're the ones that get all the advertising uh, contracts and uh, the millions of dollars. And frankly, it's a lot harder for them to come out. When you come out and you're a big star, you lose a lot of money. Martina Navratilova lost a lot of money. And yet she came out. And we're finding in the media, I've long known Anderson Cooper was gay, but he just came out. Good for him. And it was an amazing thing for me to watch and listen to Anderson Cooper talk with a number of people about Jason Collins coming out and mentioning, ever so matter-of-factly, his own journey, his own decision to come out publicly. I mean, most of these uh, people like Anderson Cooper had been out publicly to his friends and family for a long time, but he was afraid it would hurt his career. And of course, um, Anderson Cooper is very talented and has done quite well. I myself have been out of the closet since, well, since uh, long before I was in radio. I was out when I worked for Congressman Barney Frank as uh, his legislative counsel on the Hill. Of course, a gay guy working for a gay congressman, I guess, isn't that unusual. But you got to remember that when I moved here to Washington, D.C., and I lived and I still live in Virginia, just across the river, it was illegal, illegal for gay people to have sex in Virginia. You could be arrested and put in prison to consenting adults for having sex. In fact, the law was so harsh in Virginia that married couples, male and female married couples, it was against the law to have oral sex. Now that's not ancient history. That's less than 10 years ago. So we have come an amazingly long way. And I think it sometimes when you've come away in civil rights and you look at the fact that Rhode Island becoming the 10th state to allow gay people to marry got almost no news at all. And Delaware's around the corner and New Jersey's around the corner. This used to be big news. And now nobody notices. And that's a good thing. You know, it's, it's still shocking to me that Don't Ask, Don't Tell ended just a year ago. For decades, we had people in the military not allowed to be honest. Not allowed to be honest. People who you would think are taught to be honest, right? Soldiers and airmen and, and, and uh, pe- uh, uh, people in the Navy, Marines. You would think integrity would be one of the things they teach in our military. And yet our military was requiring people to lie. Requiring our honorable armed forces who are risking their lives to help America, requiring them to lie, saying that if you tell the truth, uh, First Amendment, anybody? If you tell the truth, you will be fired. Only if you lie will you be allowed to succeed. And, you know, I can think of very few occupations where lying is a requirement. There, There are a few. 
I guess if you work as an undercover agent for the CIA, lying is a requirement. I guess if you're an actor, heck, if you're a poker player, then lying's part of the game. But if you are simply yourself, trying to be yourself, trying to be true to yourself, trying to tell the truth to the world, and you want to serve your country, until last year, that was illegal. So for all the people that are saying, eh, Jason Collins, I mean, it's not that interesting, so this guy happens to be gay, that's a good thing in a way, because it shows how far we've come. But let's look back just a little bit and recognize how far indeed we have come. The idea that it's uninteresting that a basketball player is gay in itself is an extremely far-reaching idea. Mahatma Gandhi once said, first they ignore us, then they ridicule us, then they fight us, then we win. I would add one more line to Mahatma Gandhi. I would add the last line, then they ignore us. You see, ignoring gay people or black people or women or the disabled or poor people or people of various religions, ignoring it first is a bad thing. It's a way of pretending they don't exist. What was Don't Ask, Don't Tell? It was pretending that gay people do not exist. Just recently, the uh, Iranian uh, dictator Ahmadinejad came to the United States and spoke at Colombia and was asked about gay people in Iran. He said, we have no gay people in Iran. Heck, I can remember back uh, when the Soviet Union was falling apart and the first joint interview between a Russian and American audience, I remember it was Donahue show and his Russian counterpart. And one of the Americans asked one of the Russians about uh, gay freedom in Russia. And they said, we don't, we don't have gay people in Russia. Ignoring gay people, just like, frankly, blacks were ignored. In the South, you can go back to 30s, 40s, 50s, heck, even the 60s. There'd be the, the domestic in the room, right? And that would be a, an African-American woman or man serving a rich white family. And they would talk about all kinds of things. And the person in the room was ignored. It was like they didn't exist. Ralph Allison talked about an invisible man, meaning the African-American in the room and not noticed. Almost like you would feel free to talk about anything in front of a dog. White people used to feel that way about black people. Men used to feel that way about women. Women would be in the room, but they weren't seen as fully human or fully equal or whatever, and, 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 and they, would, they wouldn't they would be noticed. When Thomas Jefferson said, all men are created equal, I don't think he was thinking about women. The men, uh, women, excuse me, women, African Americans, gay people were ignored. First, they ignore us, says Gandhi. Next, they ridicule us. When African Americans wanted full and equal rights, when women wanted full and equal rights, when gay people want full and equal rights, they are ridiculed. Ridiculed. The idea that a black man could have the same rights as a white man, even Lincoln couldn't quite fathom that. That a woman could also vote and could make decisions as well as a man. That gay people could get married just like straight people. Ridicule. What a ridiculous idea. What a crazy notion. Equality under the law. First they ignore us. Then they ridicule us. Then Gandhi says they fight us. Right now, it's no longer crazy that gay people can get married, that women can vote, that black people can be citizens and free, independent human beings. Now that we've gotten past ignoring and ridicule comes the fight. But then, Gandhi says, then we win. First they ignore us, then they ridicule us, then they fight us, then we win. And we're seeing in gay civil rights a transition from the fight to the win, to where even many Republicans are given up, where Rob Portman, has, Senator Portman, a, a conservative Republican from Ohio, has a son who's gay, and suddenly he doesn't want to fight anymore. Dick Cheney, evil on any progressive scale. Horrible person, and, and, and probably someone who is 
uh, committed a traitorous act in outing a CIA agent. I mean, I, I, no defense of Dick Cheney here, but his daughter's gay. So on that issue, he suddenly he's okay. The more people come out, the easier it is for the next generation to come out. Coming out is not an easy thing to do. I, I can say it so personally. But the more gay people, the more lesbian people, the more transgender people, the more people come out of the closet, bisexual as well, the more people realize this is just an ordinary difference of human existence. And it makes it easier for everybody else. I did a uh, YouTube interview on the Inside Scoop back in 2008. Seems like ages ago, five years ago. I did it as a joke, but a very meaningful joke. I did it as satire. I did a clip on why I thought, or I argued, we should ban left-handed marriage to keep left-handed people from marrying. Because I argued, what's left-handedness? It's a perversion. It's different. It's not normal. And it isn't. 90% of the world is right-handed. 90% of the world is straight. Left-handedness, while natural and genetic and something you're born with, is something that's different. It's abnormal. It's not usual. It's a perversion. And indeed, as I pointed out in the video, there was a time when left-handedness was considered sinister. In fact, the word sinister is from the Latin for left-handed. In fact, if you look at the French, maladroit, you know that word that means clumsy? What does it literally mean? It means not to the right. Listening, people who know French out there, maladroit, not to the right, maladroit. You're left-handed, you're clumsy, you're sinister. My own grandfather, by the way, growing up in New Orleans uh, in the 1920s, my own grandfather was left-handed and yet was required by his elementary school teacher back um, 80, 90 years ago, uh, required to use his right hand to write because the left hand was wrong and right was right. And to the day he died, my grandfather did everything with his left hand. He ate with his left hand. He fished with his left hand. But he continued to write with his right hand. He was forced against his nature to write with his right hand for no reason whatsoever. And that's what people have been trying to do to gay people for years and years and years. Force gay people to act against their nature in ways that made straight people feel better. So I did this video, which you can still find. Go to YouTube.com sometime and type in ban left. And you will see my impassioned argument for why we shouldn't let left-handed people marry. And what's funny about the video, funnier than the video, is the comments. Because two-thirds, three-quarters of the people realize it's satire, realizing I'm making a point about gay rights at the time I'm talking about left-handed people. And then maybe a quarter of the people don't get it at all and think I'm attacking left-handed people because uh, I don't break a smile. I try very hard not to. I'm doing my full Colbert-like function. And they can't understand why I'm so uh, nasty against left-handed people. The best part of the video is the caller, young man by the name of Jose. He was not uh, a plant, I assure you. He was a young man who called into my show who could not understand why I wanted to stop left-handed people from marrying, but at the same time, he wanted to stop gay people from marrying, and he couldn't tell the difference. The point is this. Coming out of the closet... Whether it's gay, today left-handed means nothing. Today, uh, you know, uh, the difference between men and women wanting men's jobs, still there's a little bit of that, but much less. First they ignore us, then they ridicule us, then they fight us, then we win. And then, I'm going to add to Mahatma Gandhi, they can ignore us again. Because the issue is not whether you're gay or straight. The issue is not, oh my God, Jason Collins hogging the microphone, saying he's gay. What a, what a prima donna. When enough athletes come out as gay, it will again be a non-issue the way it should be. The way it shouldn't matter whether a player is black or white. For Jackie Robinson, it was a big deal. Today, it's not a big deal. And I look forward to the day when it will never again be a big deal and that will be when america has truly grown up if you want to call in it's 202-889-9797 202-889-9797 this is mark levine this is the inside scoop you can follow me on twitter at mark levine talk or go to my website marklevinetalk.com and uh, type whatever you wish we'll be right back with more 
right after this. You're listening to WPWC, We Act Radio, 1480 AM, weactradio.com. My name is Joe Thompson. I'm 29 years old and I have a career that I love as a systems analyst. Career. It still sounds cool to say that word. I never could have gotten on this path without a college degree. And if the college me were here, he'd tell you. I never would have gotten to college without Big Brothers Big Sisters. I could have ended up anywhere, on the streets even. But college? Joe Thompson? Not likely. My big brother helped me out. He taught me I could do anything, at a time when a lot of people were saying just the opposite. And to a seven-year-old, that means a lot. My big brother's name is Phil. And Phil is the reason that this seven-year-old grows up to be a systems analyst. Whether you donate money or time, you're helping big brothers, big sisters help a child. And that can last a lifetime. Start something today at BigBrothersBigSisters.org. Brought to you by Big Brothers Big Sisters and the Ad Council. You're listening to WPWC We Act Radio, 1480 AM, weactradio.com. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. This is Mark Levine uh, talking about Jason Collins coming out of the closet and why it is a big deal still. It's interesting because, of course, women have been athletes, have been coming out of the closet for decades now. I brought up that uh, uh, Martina Navratilova came out in the 80s voluntarily. Uh, Billie Jean King came out involuntarily in the 1970s, and it it really harmed her endorsements and so forth. And that's uh, one of the reasons why it's still brave to come out. But it is easier for a guy, excuse me, it's easier for a woman than for a man. In fact, uh, just a few days before Jason Collins come out, came out, uh, a, a WNBA star, Brittany Griner, came out, and virtually no one noticed. Yeah, another uh, female athlete coming out, no big deal. And I'm glad it's no big deal for women. Frankly, that, that's that last stage. Right? That's that last part of Mahatma Gandhi's quote. First they ignore us, then they ridicule us, then they fight us, then we win. Then, this is the Mark Levine edition, then they ignore us again. So I don't really mind, uh, it's, you could say it's sexist, but I don't really mind the fact that people are mostly ignoring Brittany Griner because she's not the first or the second or the fifth or the tenth woman to come out of the closet. But it is fascinating when you think about it how much easier it is for any woman to come out as lesbian than it is for a guy to come out as gay. And I think that has to do with the misogyny in our culture. You see, it's okay for a woman to act like a man. It's not okay for a man to act like a woman. I want you to think about this. If a woman wants to wear pants, who complains? Maybe 50 years ago, someone might complain, you're not wearing a skirt or a dress, but a woman wearing pants, it's a pretty natural thing. Heck, even if a woman wants to wear a tie, the Annie Hall look in the 70s, nobody really will say anything. No one seems to mind a a woman wearing man's clothes or taking a man's job, and in fact, it's offensive to even suggest there is such a thing as a man's job, and I agree. But if a man wants to do a woman's job, if a man wants to be a nurse... And there are male nurses out there. If a man wants to be a flight attendant, of course there are male flight attendants out there. We used to call them stewardesses. If a man wants to wear a skirt 
And he's not Scottish and it's not a kilt and he wants to wear a dress. Who the heck cares? Why does it matter? Why does a woman who wants to wear a man's clothes be, is it, she's entirely normal and natural, and a man who wants to wear a woman's clothes, he needs psychiatric help. Have you ever thought about why that is? Now, I want to be clear here. I've never put, I have no desire to put on women's clothes. That's not something I'm into. <laughs> this isn't about me. And, but who am I to tell anyone to wear anything? When will we get rid of these notions? I think this idea, and I think the reason why it's easier for a lesbian to come out of the closet than a gay man is precisely because people understand why women want to be men, why men, women want to be equal, or why women want to have uh, men's clothes, or, or to have, frankly, men are privileged in our society, way privileged. So when women want those strong privileges, who can blame them? Few do. Maybe there are a few anti-feminists left in this world, and... They're awful people. But most of us seem to understand that women deserve equal pay for equal work, equal rights to jobs. I believe women should be in combat. I've been very clear about that. Uh, any woman who can do the job of a man should be able to do the same job, period. Whether that job is combat, whether that job is president of the United States, it doesn't matter what the job is. And that's something that most people understand today. But if a man wants to do a job that is largely thought of as a woman's job, a man wants to dance, right, in ballet, or be a nurse, or be a flight attendant. What's interesting is that most of the men who've taken these jobs, these, quote, womanly jobs, unquote, many of them are gay. And that's the stereotype, right? A male nurse has to be gay. A, what about a man who cuts your hair? What about a male florist? Flight attendant? Dancer? Well, they have to be gay. And to be fair, a lot of gay men have taken on these jobs because they want them and because they're not bothered by the stereotype that says you have to be macho, you have to be masculine, and you can't be a masculine florist or flight attendant or nurse. But why the heck not? You know, a male nurse might have the strength to lift uh, a, a, a fat person from a bedpan. Of course, a woman might have that strength too. You know, a male nurse might, you might need a good male nurse strong to lift a patient. That's very important. It's this idea of, of sort of, well, the subsidiary role, that's, that's for women, that's for gay men. What, what I think Jason Collins shows us is that, that we still live under these stereotypes. Those of you who think, well, it's no big deal, soon there will be a lot of gay athletes that will come out, and that's true. Recognize that we still have a ways to go. Until every man who wants to be a nurse can be a nurse, or a flight attendant, or a florist, or a gymnast, without being thought of as gay, we, we haven't crossed the line yet. Right? Every woman should be able to do any man's job. Every man should be able to do woman, every woman's job. We should not distinguish in occupation whether someone is male or female, gay or straight. So Jason Collins, thank you for helping us move one step further in that regard. And don't ever think coming out is easy. In the African-American community, I would venture it's harder than in the white community. And I'm, you know, it's, it's, it, he's, it's good that he's defied all stereotypes. I remember when Rock Hudson came out of course, he was forced out because he had AIDS. But Rock Hudson was this strapping male actor who was praised for his masculinity. Well, Jason Collins, <laughs> he's seven feet tall. He's an active, bruising player. And I think he stunned and helped people understand that, yes, there's gay people of all shapes and sizes. But let me give a notion out to some other people in power who have more power than Jason Collins, who are still in the closet. Yes, I'm talking to you, Senator... I'm not going to say the name. I'm not going to say the name because even though I think this particular senator from a very democratic state should come out of the closet because I think when this senator comes out, it will surprise some, not to those of us in Washington. I, I happen to know of 
at least three senators who are gay in Congress that have not come out. One from a very liberal Democratic state, one from a very conservative Republican state, and one from, uh, I guess, a more moderate state in the middle. They haven't come out yet. They're not as brave as Tammy Baldwin, the first openly gay senator from Wisconsin. But they need to be. Because the more people come out, the more people realize it's no big deal. The more people understand that that's just part of the nature of humanity. And the easier it is for that kid in school to live his or her life and not be taunted and not be mistreated. To this day, a third of the teenagers that kill themselves are gay. And we know a third of teens aren't gay but they're highly represented in the suicide population. Once people understand that, yes, people of all stripes are gay or bisexual or lesbian, then it's a lot easier for that next generation. Martina Navratilova made it easier for Jason Collins. Jason Collins will make it easier for the football player, the hockey player, the baseball player to come out. And they will. We already have ex-football, ex-NFL players, ex-NBA players, ex-baseball players who've come out of the closet. But Jason Collins was the first male athlete to come out who was still actively playing. And I hope it helps his career. No doubt it hurt Martina Navratilova's career. But I hope we have reached the stage where it's a plus for Jason Collins, who is 34 years old and is not, you know, he's not the top rung of players, but he's steady. He's been on six different teams. I hope it helps him. I hope teams work hard to get a gay player. I got to tell you, it's partly, I think, because the teams have shown that they can support gay people, that it's been easier for people like Jason Collins to come out. The NHL made it very clear, the National Hockey League, that they supported gay players coming out. You had some terrific straight football allies write very strong words to make clear that they would support their colleagues coming out that, again, made it easier for Jason Collins to come out. And Jason, to his credit, mentioned in the Sports Illustrated article that all of you should read, mentioned and praised all the people that came before him. And the other thing that he said that I think is really important is that he wanted to come out on his own terms. There's a huge difference between the National Enquirer outing you and following you and watching your every move and then disclosing in some sordid way that you happen to be gay or lesbian and you coming out on your own terms, bravely saying, yeah, I'm gay, what of it? There's a huge difference. And Jason now no longer has to live in fear. See, what I think straight people don't understand is that gay people, are before they come out, constantly live in fear. Who knows? Who's going to out me? Who's going to um, keep me from achieving what I want in my career or my life? Who's going to tell my family? It's like you've committed a crime, only you've done nothing wrong. But once you come out, all those fears go away. I mean, look at someone like Anderson Cooper, right? People whispered all the time. And now he's out, and it's no big deal. And there's a certain self-satisfaction, there's a certain self-worth in being able to honestly say who you are. And that's what Jason Collins did. And I think that we can, while we still have a ways to go as a nation, and we still have a ways to go where a male, a man can be a nurse or a flight attendant or a florist without being thought of as gay, where women can fight in combat and women can play basketball without being thought of as gay. So we, we actually have some straight stereotypes we have, to, we have to stop. We have to allow straight people to do these things. Just as we have gay male basketball players, we need to have straight female basketball players and, and, and not be worried about that. We need to have gay, uh, straight male ball, uh, ballet dancers, just as we know we have some very brave gay men and women 
fighting in combat and serving their country in the military. So we still have a ways to go. But if you ever want to look back and see how far we've come, well, just look at Jason Collins. In any civil rights movement, any civil rights movement, you can always look back and forward. You should always look back and forward. You should always recognize how far we've come. You should always recognize how far we have yet to go. And yet with Jason Collins, I think it would be unheard of just five years ago for a male athlete to decide to come out on his own without being outed by some sordid tabloid newspaper. And it's because Barack Obama now supports marriage equality. It's because the majority of American people now support marriage equality. It's because figures like Anderson Cooper have come out. It's because of will and grace. It's because our culture has changed. I got a call on the line. Let's get to that real quick before I sum up. Who is on the line here? Welcome to the Inside Scoop. Hello, this is We Act Radio. Mark Levine, you're on the air. Is this a... Uh, I don't know if this call is, is meant for the air. I don't hear anyone. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Ah, turn off the mute button. There we go. Who is this? This is uh, Yusuf Muhammad from Las Vegas, Nevada. Hello, welcome to the show. Do you have a comment on what I'm saying about Jason Collins coming out? Uh, I was just kind of cold because I, I was watching the Rock Newman show, and uh, I wanted to find out about uh, him and Rock, Rock scheduling uh, a showdown for the minister in Las Vegas. Uh, okay, you're, you're calling into a radio show at We Act Radio in Washington, D.C., Mark Levine's Inside Scoop. Are you calling in the right number? <laughs> uh, I was calling on the number that he, uh, Rock gave uh, le- uh, week four last. Okay, I'm not. Sh- I'm not sure you're calling the right place right now, but uh, okay. l- let me get you off the air, and you can you can call again. Thanks. Okay. Sorry about that. I, I sometimes I I don't have a producer in studio, and I take my own calls, and uh, I'm not sure what that was about. But let me let me just close up by saying this: If you ever want a milepost for how far we've come, just look at the response to Jason Collins coming out. Versus, well, just the actively anti-gay rhetoric that we heard five years ago. I mean, it was five years ago that we heard comments by various uh, sports people that they they didn't like gay people. uh, They wouldn't work with gay people. And what happened? Well, now, unlike the Women's Tennis Association didn't want want Martina Navratilova to come out, now you're fined by the uh, NFL or the NHL if you make anti-gay comments. And what it shows is that when people at the top make very clear that homophobia won't be punished, it makes it a lot easier for people to come out. Harry Truman made it very clear in 1948 to all the racists in the military who didn't want the military to be segregated that he would not tolerate people, uh, whites who refused to serve with blacks in the military. And there were whites who did refuse to serve with blacks in 1948, and they were drummed out lickety split. So the same is true with sports today. If you make homophobic comments, you are fined. You are punished. So it's striking to me that the only negative comment that I've read about Jason Collins coming out was uh, a a sports guy named uh, uh, Mike Wallace. And Mike Wallace gave was really a fairly limited response. It wasn't near as homophobic as some of the really nasty stuff that we saw as recently as 2007 or 2011. He said, all these beautiful women in the world and guys want to mess with other guys. Shake my head, SMH. As anti-gay comments go, that's relatively tame. That's something that some of my friends might say to me as a joke. And yet... Almost within minutes, actually within minutes, four minutes later, he had deleted that tweet and followed it up with, I'm not bashing anybody. Don't have anything against anyone. I just don't understand it. I'm laughing because, well, it shows how far we've come. It shows how far we've come that even a relatively harmless tweet was immediately deleted. Because we live in a different world from just five years ago. 
a world where prejudice is at least not publicly tolerated. And that is a big step forward. Obviously, we still have racism. Obviously, we still have sexism. But the fact that racism and sexism are much less publicly tolerated is a big step forward. And the same is true with homophobia. And sports was honestly, now that the military is, uh, has equality and marriage is coming up with equality, sports for men, that was kind of was the last readout. The last place where homophobia could continue to exist was the locker room. And Jason Collins... You've taken a big step forward in ending that prejudice. So we still have a few more firsts to go. We're going to wait for the first football player and, of course, the first hockey player and uh, the first baseball player to come out. And it's going to be tough. And then they're going to say, wait for the first uh, really good player to come out. Right? They're going to wait for the first Martina Navratilova of baseball, uh, the one that hits most of the home runs to come out. And then he'll come out too. And then, and then, and then there'll be no more firsts. And then there will come a day when, to quote Martin Luther King, when people aren't judged by the color of their skin, when all humanity can come together. On the day when there are no more firsts, on the day when it really is not news whether someone is gay or straight, whether a black or a white person is playing on a team, whether your doctor is male or female, whether your senator is a man or a woman, or gay or straight. So come out, come out wherever you are. I'm out. And I encourage everyone to come out too. When you come out, you're not just helping yourself and you are helping yourself. It's a lot easier to live the truth than a lie. It's very, very hard to keep up with that lie. But you're helping generations to follow. Jason Collins is one of the last of the firsts. And he can only do what he did because of all the firsts that came before him. So if you're listening, three senators in Washington who are still not out of the closet, two of you I know could come out right now and have no political harm to you whatsoever. You live in states that are solid blue states, solid progressive states, states that would welcome your coming out. And frankly, you have no excuse not to do so. One's a Democrat, one's a Republican. And uh, to you, Senator, that's from a solid red Republican state, I understand why you're in the closet. But I look forward to the day when even you can come out. That day, eventually... Still not too far away when all men and women are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Jason Collins, you've taken us one step forward to fulfilling Thomas Jefferson's words in the Declaration of Independence, and I personally want to thank you for it. And I hope you're listening, like all the Washington Wizards, to We Act Radio, AM 1480. This is Mark Levine. This is the Inside Scoop. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you want more information on me, uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Mark Levine Talk, M-A-R-K-L-E-V-I-N-E-T-A-L-K. You can go to my website, MarkLevineTalk.com. Follow me on Facebook. Friend me. I'll friend you back, I promise. Go to the Mark Levine fan page, and I'll be back, of course, next week right here at We Act Radio for the Raucous Caucus at noon and the Inside Scoop at 1. Until then... This is Mark Levine signing off. Next up is Maya Rockymore, and you're going to hear from her just two minutes from now.